Click, buy, deliver. With remote purchasing from the two-time Motorcycle News Dealer of the Year, Colchester Kawasaki. Proud sponsors of Chasing the Racing. Three, two, one, and welcome back to Chasing the Racing, episode 122. We're down at uh, Silverstone, Silverstone National BSB round. Um, we're delighted to be joined by Lee Hardy. How are we doing? Good, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, and uh, I've, it'll have been a busy day. It, tonight is uh, Saturday evening, so we've actually had our first races of the weekend. And uh, your, your lads will have been busy in the garage tonight. Yeah. Not for... <laughs> not, um, Ryan's fault uh, for for uh, got wiped out today. I was he? about to say I was running around like a blue ass flag, and someone walked through exactly what happened. So unfortunately, was it Bucking? Was, yeah, yeah, it? yeah. It's just it's one of those things, really. We got a bit beaten up from the from the start. Um, we had a bit of an issue down here at the hairpin with with Christian ran wide, lost places that we shouldn't have really been losing, and then you know it just opened the door a bit. There was a bit of a gap. You know, Danny sort of like showed a front wheel and tried to get through, but there weren't really enough there wasn't enough space to get through you know mm. and they came together and they both went down um you know danny was apologetic about it it's it's one of those things it's hard because we know well we knew we had good pace for the race uh tire life was good so we felt today you know we could we could do something we could really get a good result um ep3 we fry, tried a few things and like i say we had good consistency good tire life and it was just a shame we couldn't really show that that was the end of lap two and we was on the deck how bad is this place on tires you know when you think it's like now but i've never been around here myself on a motorcycle but it looks like right 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 you must obliterate them is that the case lads it's well for us we, it's not been too bad um obviously they've changed the the tires that we can use here we can't use the SEX we're running the zero and then the option tire that they bring for here and for Thruxton so we have been using we have used the uh, the option tire we've done some work with that in FP1 but to be fair like I say tire life's been good with the zero so there wasn't really a lot of point to revisit back to that but me and Lauren will walk around the place now the Tannoy system there's only been a couple of riders that run them weekend weekend out and is that Josh Brooks who's running them yeah, he's on the zero. Who else is on the zero consistently? Uh, Glenn Irwin's another one that tends to yeah. to run the zero a lot. Um, and I don't know what it is. Whether it's just more flavour for them, you know, better consistency. Great word to <laughs> analyse that. Great flavour. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, we tend to use the X pretty much everywhere. Um, maybe we got caught out a little bit at Snetterton. We probably should have done a bit more work with the with the zero, but temperatures there it just it soared. You know that was the thing. Temperatures just went up and up and up and up. And for us, the big thing was the the last race that did get stopped. And I don't really know what went on there. You know our rear tire just literally fell off a cliff. Um, we had good consistent lap time up to that point. The red flag. We came in. We restarted, and it was literally like we was on a different bike. We just went backwards. Um, and the big thing there, you know, you look at even sort of the second lap of the restart, you look at some of the pictures of our tyre compared to some of the others behind us, and you could just see it even in the pictures, it was just completely gone. And, and uh, in terms of, uh, obviously we're at Silverstone, in terms of a sort of safety, this, um, you'd put your, you'd put money on this being like the sort of safest track that we come to in terms of like there's loads of runoff yeah uh, it's really nice and wide flat uh there's no like sort of blind crests or anything yet yeah, today oh. this well this weekend really there's been some horrendous injuries mm. uh, and yeah obviously this this podcast will be going out like two weeks in advance but uh, we'll obviously send we're our time travelers yeah, yeah. we'll yeah. <laughs> we send our best wishes to all the all the uh, riders that have crashed today but yeah some uh in in the super stock thousand there damo reese the lad from yep. new zealand <sighs> Um, I'm not. Sh I'm not sure if he high sided or because it was still a little bit damp, so he might have hit a damp patch. Yeah. But he had a huge crash and uh, broken. Which you know, turn was many, that, by the way? Many bones. Uh, coming out of turn one, but he was he was like halfway down that straight right. when he stopped uh, the crash when he Ooh. stopped, and then uh, Jack Kennedy got wiped out in the super uh, super sport race. And yeah, I think I saw he's, that. Yeah, it looked nasty that, and I think he must have broken something because yeah, I think I just saw something on social media. I think he's broken a toe. Um, so yes, probably I. not as bad as what 
originally it looked. Um, but obviously, it's bad enough when you when you're fighting for a championship and uh, you've got a broken toe. And, yeah, and in Superbikes today as well, there was a, obviously there was the incident with yourse- yourselves and mm. Buchan, but also Hickman had a huge yeah, crash. Big. And uh, t- obviously, right at the end of the race, there Taz came through, hunted uh, Jason down, passed him into down into Brooklyn's the left, and just that's the only left. Yeah. on the track so it tends to be uh, slightly cold on the left hand side just he asked for a tiny bit of throttle and it wasn't a massive slide but it was just enough to throw him over the handlebars ah. and poor jason had absolutely nowhere he to go he took his teammate out again yeah. on the other <laughs> corner you just did oh my. i wonder if he hit the floor and went ow me wrist and then followed by what the f- but, but yeah but his taz <laughs> taz uh broken his wrist i think so his, yeah i think yeah. we just heard that he has he has broken his wrist. Taz, Taz recently is the form that he's been mm. on over the last. I know Jason's Mid. been dominating. Mm. As, well, it was kind of Jason and Christian dominating the yeah. first, you know, five rounds or so. Then Taz came. Taz came on so strong the last few rounds. Really took it to him at Donington, and yeah. then it uh, snetted in the other day. Did he won two out of the three? He got two wins in a second, yeah. I think. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, obviously, it's it's such close margins, isn't it? You see, that, that's got to be one of the best things about British is it's the form, isn't it? Let, let's talk about you at Cadwell. You know, what mm. Ryan did. What, hold on, what was the previous lap record? A 126.3 or something like that. And then you were banging out 25s. Yeah, we was, we was, point, <laughs> we was point 0.6 under the lap record, which, which is was, huge. Yeah, oh yeah, it's night and day. Especially at a circuit like Cadwell as well. You know, it was incredible. Um, there's always got it's always got its downside um, because obviously you do that lap and then you know he came back into the box and he was like you know it felt good I made a few mistakes and uh, you know I was a bit like "Mm, I don't think they were really mistakes you know it's just (laughs) the pace you were at it's not going to feel perfect you know there are going to be little bits where you feel probably that you've made a mistake but it's more the fact that you were just so over the limit and close it's, to the limit it's a hell of an achievement for as a ride around a team to yeah. have the fastest two wheel lap at probably the most technical and it's like the most difficult track really to ride yeah. so and uh, yeah to do that in free practice is like unbelievable yeah it was just it was unreal i think you know when you look at the whole of the weekend probably credit wasn't due you know you looked at that and then a lot of people probably look at that and think oh well it was one lap you know it was only a lap but to do that lap was just phenomenal. And again, the pace for us at Cadwell was was brilliant. You know, the, the pace in the dry, the pace in the wet. You know, we could come in, we could box. You naturally lose places as people are lapping straight back out. You know, P2, P3, really strong. And we, we felt good there. But obviously the crash in qualifying, it, 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 was, it was big enough, that you was, know. That was, that was tasty. Yeah. It was flavorful, yeah, flavorful. <laughs> and uh, the thing, the thing with that, you know, it's people don't always see the whole picture. They see the crash and they think, "Oh, yeah, he's crashed again." You know that sort of thing. But when you're on the limit like that, you're always going to make mistakes. And if you're not close to the limit, then you're not going to be in a position to to ever win anything, you know, or ever achieve anything. All the riders out there are on the ragged edge and at the full limit. And the biggest thing really was just. The fact that he was so beaten up, you know, he's he's injured his MCL. Um, he was just sore. His wrist was sore. His leg was sore. And to be fair, the biggest thing was was the need that was causing him the issue. And you'll know yourself riding yourself. A lot of people watch it and think you just sat in the seat everywhere. Yeah. You know you're not. You know, you, all your weight is in your legs. You're using your legs to change direction a lot of the time. So come the race, it was just so hard. Um, and it just didn't flow, you know, it just feels unnatural then to be more sat on the seat and trying to use your upper body to to steer the bike. So it was just really hard, but he did a great job, you know, to go out there and consolidate and race in all three races. It would have been very easy to try it and then go, you know, I'm not really feeling it. And knowing the fact that he had the pace at the start of the weekend to, you know, at the end of the day to challenge for wins or be on the podium. So it was hard to come away with three top tens, you know, when I've, we knew we had more in the bag. I've got to say, fair play to your team as well for um, for getting the bike out after qualifying for race one. I was sat on the bottom of the bank and they were talking about it in the town, will he do it, will he not? And I was with 20 the, quid I was with the group of lads. The <laughs> I was with the, I'm not going to lie, I was with the group of lads and I, and I said, there's absolutely no way that that bike will finish the race. I said, like, Cheers, to, Chrissy. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 reflection on, no reflection on you and the team. I can't wait to come on your show. I just, said, I, I just thought, there's 
absolutely no way in that sh- short space of time to rebuild everything. Yeah. And there's always going to be like a sensor problem or quick shifter not working or things. And I just said, there's no way that that bike will finish. And he came around and like, he finished seventh or eighth. Yeah, yeah. I was like, well, yeah. that's, that's shows how much I know. But to, yeah, unbelievable job. To be Chris. fair, to be, thank you for that. But uh, to be fair, you know, that's what the preparation's about. That's when you're back at the workshop. You know, that's what you do in the winter. You, you prepare for those sorts of incidents. You have to have the biggest thing, especially now with the three race weekends, the short turnarounds, you have to have the stuff prepared. You have to have your sub assemblies, you know. And it's very easy when you have a, a bit of a nothing crash to just go, right, I'll take the sub assembly. And then someone forgets to rebuild it, you know. So for us, our sub assemblies are there built. We have a swing and arm with a chain on it, hugger everything ready to go the you know everything's there just ready to bolt straight in i was about to say for our listeners that won't know what a sub assembly is you've just kind of explained that haven't you yeah. so it's, it's, that's just a separate already built bike yeah like, yeah that you can't what are the rules well, not, within that not within a built bike it's built parts of assemblies of a bike basically with the ruling that we have in bsb you're not allowed to have a fully built bike as a as a spare um you have to present the frame to scrutineering before you're allowed to change the frame and realistically all we have on the frame is we'll have uh foot pegs on the frame the the rear brake line is cable tied into the frame ready to come out on the the top of the headstock to to connect um and the pivots are in the frame cable tied in and that's about it so that had to be presented to scrutineering before we even started so my job was to get that to scrutineering luckily at cadwell the scrutineers in the bottom paddock we had to we had to wait for the clearance to come from Colin to say that we could do it, and the main reason behind that is is safety. The thing that we've found with our knowledge of Kawasaki, when the bike tends to crash, it does tend to bend the headstock, and the weird thing being, it always tends to go off to the left hand side. And what we've done over a previous time with the experience we've got, we've produced data back to 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 the guys to show that when the bikes have then gone to motorliner after a crash, there is proof that the, the frame has been bent. And at the end of the day, you don't know how badly bent it is. And when you look back quickly at the pictures that have been taken, the bike took a big hit on the on the front. Um, the rear wheel was excessively bent. You know, there was, you could see that it had some big impacts. So that's why we spoke to Colin. We said, look, you know, we aren't in a position to know how safe that frame is. So we need to reframe the bike. And, to be fair, it was it was the I wouldn't say the quicker option because there's still a lot of work to do. You know, we we dropped the engine out of the the bike that we had while the boys were were doing that. Our data guy was looking through the data to see if it had lost oil pressure or anything along those lines because the last thing you want to do is spend time dropping an engine that's been sat there, you know, running for 20 seconds with no oil pressure because all you're going to do is just build a bike and then have another problem. Mm. Um, so. The only thing that slowed us down a bit, we normally have a, a front end sub assembly. So we'll have a set of forks built with yokes ready to, to bolt in with brake lines, throttle, everything on it, switch gear. So for instance, Donington Park last year, we we built a bike, we'd done an engine. Um, he went down at the hairpin with an incident with Andrew Irwin and the bike basically ran on its side. Um, Ryan then picked the bike back up, restarted the bike, toodled back through the paddock to the uh, to the garage unbeknown to him he'd rode it back for about 35 seconds 40 seconds with no oil pressure so we were like right new engine so basically with that there wasn't a great deal of damage from the crash but we did an engine out back in and running within 40 minutes and the guy that was working with us at the time um dicko who was on the on the side with with kennedy um and also luke quigley they were both working on that side of the garage couldn't believe it they were just like blown away the fact they walked back in the garage and it was running and they were like no way followed by jack kennedy who came in and was like that cannot be another engine in there and we were like yeah it is and he just gave us a round round of applause and was like i'm blown away but it's about the preparation you know that's that's come from sort of my side having good people working with me in the past who suggest things look at different areas you know all of last year we well previous to last year we spent a lot of time working on engine stands so we could have an engine complete with a radiator uh, headers on it the the loom has been redesigned so that basically we've got an engine loom rather than the chassis loom so the engine's on the bike the throttle bodies are on the on the on the engine all ready to bolt in the water's bled up the oil's bled up 
on the button, ready to go. Lee Hardy, endurance racer, first team to do an engine <laughs> swap in like the, the Le Mans 24 hour like that. <laughs> <laughs> Off you go, 220 brakes, so not yeah. you go. <laughs> so, uh, well, it's 228 actually. All right, massive. All right, massive. I've, I've, got, to, I've got to say that because the guys at MSS, Jeb at MSS, he does a fantastic job on our engine, you know. Ever since we went to Kawasaki, again, it's something we looked at and was like, right, where do we want to go for the engines? And we looked at different different people and he came on board or Nick came on board and, and done some work with us. And we haven't looked back really, you know, that the bike that we've got is phenomenal. You know, it's very reliable and it's fast. So many riders have come up to me this year and just been like, wow, that thing is a missile. And to be fair, it is, you know, and I think some of that is Ryan as well. You know, he's a small rider. He gets tucked in very well. So in terms of speed... I think the biggest part of him is his fringe, to be yeah, fair, isn't it? It's like, you know, it's, it's like, I like good that. Thing, good thing he's got a big, strong lid on it. You know what I mean? Keep that fucker down. <laughs> Oh, Watch out, he's going to bray me, aren't he? He's, oh, here we go. Sorry. That's Ryan kicking off. He's like, oh, I heard that comment. There you go. I tell you what, that is being natural pervert Brayton. And you were talking about the past. There'll be listeners going, do you think is- that? No. Uh, <laughs> there we <laughs> are. <laughs> yeah, avoid that one. Avoid that one for the day. Let's uh, bail on that one. There we go. I tell you what, uh, we've, uh, speaking about this year, just... Um, do you want to go back to uh, like yeah. people know you from uh, like the BSB or the road racing or whatever, but it's always interesting to see, you know, you don't just turn around one day and have a big race team yeah. and things. Unless so, you did, because like, that'll cut the question. Well, yeah, yeah. Go down, like, yeah, I'm here did, now. That's, yeah. that's the end of this pod. Did, did you, I take it you used to race yourself. Yeah. I, I started out doing a, doing a few track days as we all do. And to be fair, I enjoyed doing the track days and one of my friends sort of said to me, he said, you know, he said, you spend a lot of money doing track days. You might as well, you might as well start racing. But what a fool I was by thinking it would cost similar to doing a track day. So, um, I started racing the orange bib with new era in the super club. I was doing the Honda Hornet, uh, championship. And that was at a time when the class was, the class was good. There was a lot of people in it. You know, we had our own races at times rather than being in with, with other classes as well. So I enjoyed that. You know, it was, it was a great sort of, um, way to cut my teeth into getting into racing. So that's where I started, started doing that. Then I moved on from there to Thundersport. Um, new era sort of like died a bit of a death and sort of finished up as a club so i moved across to thunder sport still thinking this is cheaper than track days oh, probably you, oh, by, your the, balls probably deep by this point i was like i'm committed i've just got to carry on <laughs> so so i went across to thunder sport and i rode the hornet there in their street fighter class in the naked class for um for a year and then i went from there on to street fighter a with an aprilia to ono and probably wasn't the bike to be on it was a big lump to muscle around and I did all right on it to be fair we we had some good success I finished second in the championship in the in the Hornet class um few few podiums with the Aprilia I was at the time I was racing against a guy Jamie Wilkins who was the fast bikes guy and to be fair he, he lived up to the to the magazine he worked for he was fast you know he was always down the road no one could ever catch him he was you really had a lucky day if you ever saw him do you know what I mean so um I had a couple of second places to him and then had a bit of a nasty crash uh, at Pembury um crashed at the first corner at the at the hairpin and got <laughs> the run slowest over. part of the circuit <laughs> yeah it was it was luckily it didn't turn into a high side but it could have very it could have very soon escalated but i went down on the inside um and one of the guys who was in the street fighter c class which was like the supermoto class just basically just went straight over the top of me Ooh. um went over the top of my arm big black mark over the over my lid and to be fair the race got red flagged, not because of me, because of a guy um, slightly further around the track had crashed and injured himself. He broke his arm. Um, so the race got red flagged. I picked the bike up. Didn't think there was a lot wrong with it. Rode it back to the paddock, got back to the paddock. Um, they delayed the race till later in the day. And to be fair, luckily they did because I did not have a clue where I was. The guy um who i used to work with jamie sampson who was my mechanic at the time you know i said to him i was like may i do not remember these trees being at snetterton and he just <laughs> he just looked at me and i was thinking what's he looking at me like that for and he was like mate we're not snetterton we're at pembury i was like where's pembury he's like in wales i was like 
oh, a little way from home then, aren't we? And I just didn't have a clue where it was. I was obviously, I hadn't been knocked out, but I was very heavily concussed. Um, <laughs> needed some parts to to rebuild it. But the guy at the time, there was a guy called Mick Corrigan, um, who was running an Aprilia Tuono team in Street Fighter as well, a couple of riders riding for him. So I went over to Blags and Bits and he was like, you're not having them. And I was like, what do you mean I'm not having them? And he was like, you are in no state to be going out in that restart. And uh, anyway, the race got delayed till later in the day. And I think it was about three o'clock. I'd sort of come sort of back to my own sort of senses of it. Went back, managed to borrow the bits, got the bike rebuilt, went out, finished second. And I, to be fair, I was sore. I'd broke a couple of ribs and it was, it was a big effort. And I remember uh, driving home after the weekend just thinking, what am I doing? You know? <laughs> I'm too old for this now. What am I doing? Rolling around on the floor, you know, driving home, like can hardly breathe, getting back home, couldn't sleep, going to work the next day and just thought, do you know what? What were you doing for a job at this point? Still working, uh, still working at the RAF. So I work as an MOD civil servant. So oh, right. I thought this was just a brilliant blag straight into no, the RAF. No. <laughs> a, a lot, a lot, a lot of people think that I'm a full time team team manager, team owner. I'm not. You know, right. to me, it's still it's still a hobby. You know, I don't get paid to do it. Um, I do it because I love doing it. Yeah, and because of my connection of racing previous. So I've worked with I've worked with the RAF with the MOD twenty three years now. Right. So yeah, and my day job really is I work as a technician. I started off working there as basically like a general vehicle mechanic. But you're on just it. working on a Honda Hornet every weekend. <laughs> this much, job needs yeah. done, son. This job needs done. <laughs> Pretty much. So working on anything, you know, from Land Rovers to tanks to fire engines, the whole the whole works. So and I've just sort of progressed up. I suppose my role now, if you looked at it compared to sort of outside world, I now sort of work more of a service manager sort of role where bring in, manpower, uh, bring in uh, vehicles when they need doing, issue the manpower to the vehicles do the MOTs, do the vehicle inspections. So I've sort of moved up to a point where how we work within the MOD, there's not a great deal of progression and like development to go really far. Um, obviously there is within the, the Air Force itself, but with the civil servant side, there's not. So I've sort of reached the the highest point of where I'm going to go within, yeah. within the job, but I still enjoy it. They allow me to do time to come and do this. Um, and I suppose in a way that's where it really all sort of started for me um bus ribs turned yeah. up on monday yeah this is the crack Go yeah. from there <laughs> and i just sort of thought you know i need to do something different so at the time there was a there was a guy who's at marham based at marham he was an raf uh, electrician aircraft electrician he also raced with thunder sport in the 600 super stock class a guy called tom gazard and he finished second, I think it was, in the championship. Uh, I can't remember who it was to. But, you know, I sort of said to him, I was like, you know, I, I, I want to do something in British. I want to go to British. You know, I want to do something there. He was too old to do stock stock 600. So um, we discussed doing potentially stock 1,000. But we was a little bit like, you know, I don't think we've got the budget to, to do that, to go that far. So... We spoke about the Ducati Cup and we was looking at that and thinking, right, we're probably going down that route. It's achievable. Um, he was going to ride the bike. I was going to put the infrastructure in place and then look after it and run it. Bring some sponsors in, hopefully get a bit of money in to pay a few tyre bills and, you know, we just go see how we got on. Um, but that escalated quite quickly, really. I got talking to a guy who was head of marketing for Honda UK, a guy called Tom Hobbs. And... Got talking to Tom and I said to him, I said, look, you know, I'm not on the blag. I don't want anything. All as I'm asking is look yes. through my portfolio. <laughs> tell me where I'm going wrong. I said, you know, I can pick up product sponsors. I cannot get a financial guy over the line. You know, I cannot really do anything with it. And I'd looked at, we'd looked at big companies, you know, blue chip companies. And he looked at the, he looked at the portfolio and he basically just turned around and he said, what you're asking for isn't enough. And I was just like, I was blown away. I was like, wow. I was like, well, you know, why isn't it enough? And he said, it's not achievable. We said for that amount of money. And I said, yeah, but you know, I've got the connections with the MOD, with the RAF, you know, we've got our own newspapers, we've got our own magazines. I don't need to pay to advertise in there. I said, you know, all the editorials, everything's all FOC. I said, I can do that and reach out to that, to that market. And he's like, yeah, but people look at that and just think it's not going to happen. So anyway, cut a long story short on that. He, he just really sort of turned around. And he said, well, why haven't you approached Honda? And I was like, well, 
because I want to do the Ducati Cup and you build Hondas, not Ducatis. And he's like, well, you know, can your rider not go in stock six? And now he's too old for that. Well, what about stock thousand? And I was like, well, we can't really afford it. And he said, you know, well, what's the biggest cost? And I said, well, at the end of the day, I said, buying the bike outright, I said, and building it, preparing it, you know, I said, it's a big cost that the, this moment in time we probably can't afford. So he turned around and he said to me, he said, um, well, I think we'd be interested in, in helping out. Didn't really know where it was going to go at this point. And he turned around and said to me, he said, right, put an email together, put a presentation together, send it to me, send it to this guy, Neil Tuxworth. He said, you ever heard of Neil Tuxworth? I was like, yeah, yeah, of course I've heard of Neil Tuxworth. <laughs> and at this point, I'm sort of thinking, from what I've sort of heard of Neil Tuxworth, he's probably going to literally open the email and just go, Jock off <laughs> in, in that quicker that quicker sentence. Um, so I sent I sent the email through, and this was probably probably late November um, two thousand and eleven. Uh, and I sent the email through. We was away from work. We always finished quite early being MOD. We like to uh, wrap up for Christmas, <laughs> so um, we, we finished around sort of the eighteenth. Didn't go back to work till like the fourth of December. Uh, sorry, fourth of uh, January. So I go back into work on the 4th. I told a couple of lads at work about it. I was like, you know, I'll put this thing to Neil Tuxworth. I was like, I'm totally wasting my time. It's not going to go anywhere, but it's exciting. and Something might happen. So I, I get back into work. I get a call on my mobile on the 5th. No ID call. I thought, oh, okay, I answered it. Um, Hello, Lee. How are you? And I'm thinking, I don't recognize his voice. So I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm all right. Yeah. Who's this? That's Neil Tuxworth. And I'm thinking, someone's having me on here. Someone is pulling my leg. <laughs> so I'm stood in the middle of the yard at work on my mobile, being as nonchalant as, as I possibly could, thinking, I'm not going to fall for it. And I'm walking around the yard, looking around, thinking, who's on the phone? Someone's going to walk out in a minute. <laughs> Got you. And I'm chatting away to Neil, and we're on the phone probably for about four or five minutes. By this point, I start to think, shit, it is actually Neil Tuxworth on the phone. So uh, <laughs> I did apologise to him the first time I met him. And I said, look, I'm really sorry about that phone call. I said, but I thought someone was having my pants down, you know. <laughs> and uh, he was like, no, 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 that's okay. It happens all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so Neil came over to, to Marum, to RF Marum. We had a meeting. Um, we discussed options. And pretty much he left there that day. We were sort of 99% sure that they were basically going to supply us with a with a bike to do the championship. And that's what they did. They built us a bike for the 2012 championship when we first started in Superstock 1000. And that was the year that was Gary Johnson and Jason O'Halloran were on the Samsung Honda in Superstock. So they basically just built us a identical bike to what they had. I went and picked it up full Olin suspension, spare wheels. I had a parts account with, with Honda. Everything was in place. So that's how it all started. And I owe a lot to... What year was this? That was 2012. We started in, in Superstock 1000. So um, um, I owe a lot you're to... You're a young that. team then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be Next year, obviously, be the 10th anniversary for us. Um, so, you know, people tend to think we've been around forever. And it's... Whether it's because of the success we had in 18, I don't know. But we certainly got put on the map. And and like I say, but in terms of what we're competing against, you know, the people that we've competed against up to now, like we've won a, we won a first ever Superbike race in 2014 with, with Hickman at Cadwell. And in the, oh, in the rain, it was it, absolutely yeah, biblical. Yeah, it? it was. It was a hell of a day. Um, and, you know, when the people came up to you and was like, congratulations, you know, well done. And... Again, it probably didn't sink in till I sort of a week later and I sort of looked back and I thought, some of them people that came up and shook my hand that day have never won a race in Superbike. And I sort of realised then and thought, shit, what you've achieved there is 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 fantastic. I'm pretty sure there's, a, there's about seven or eight teams in the history of BSB that have won. There's not there's, hard, there's hardly any teams yeah. if you think really? about it. Yeah, 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 there's hardly any. Yeah, there's not, there's not many. Like you say, a lot of the teams that are here have been here a long while um and like i say for us that was our first ever year in superbike it was just it just could, could i just uh, backtrack a little bit so your first year on the honda 2012 was that ref backed yeah in a well sort of yeah it was we had a couple of other sponsors on board um the ref came on board that year um nowhere near to where they have been recently but they they came on board they helped out they put some costs in place that they they would cover for us um 
and brought in other sponsors along the way to to achieve that. And so the first few years in Superstock, uh, who was you? Who was your rider in two thousand twelve and thirteen? Two thousand twelve was Tom Gazard, um, and we struggled really. We just struggled to qualify anywhere. That was at the time when you had like sixty two people rocking yeah. up to one race, and you know thirty two of you could be on the grid. So there was a lot of unhappy the deep people. End of it, yeah. yeah, yeah, and in in a way, there was only so many times you could you could write the dear John you know press release at the end of it. Um, so with <laughs> So, <laughs> putting a positive spin on it. Yeah, yeah. trying to. Um, so at the, at the end of at the end of two thousand, Neil Cooksworth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Neil used to text me at the end of every weekend. What happened there, Lee? Yeah, we didn't qualify. Did Your we? bikes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, to be fair, the the Honda at the time oh. wasn't probably the best bike in in stock, but it was it was a rideable bike. It was a good package. Mm. Um, and at the end of twelve, you know, I met with Neil and I said to him, I said, look, you know, we've got good bit of backing here from the REF the 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 profile's good I said but we need to up the rider quality I need to look at a professional rider and and I said to Neil I said you must have people you're looking at you know like youngsters that you're interested in and to be fair he was like no and I was like all right okay so that sort of fell on deaf ears and I was a bit like you know what do you think then what can we do and he mentioned Michael Dunlop to me and I was a bit like wow I don't know if we're ready for that and we went to the NEC, we spoke at the NEC and I just sort of said to him, I said, Neil, I don't think that's going to work. I said, you know, for me, the REF connection, you know, a new team, inexperienced, we're doing the roads as well. I was like, I'm not really, I'm not really up for that. And he was like, right, okay, okay, leave it with me. Let's see what we can do. And anyway, he rang me and he said, um, he said, I've got another option. He said, for someone to ride the bike. And I said, all right, I said, um, who's that? And he said, Simon Andrews. And at the time, you know, I'd been watching a lot of BSB and seeing what Simon had done on the Gentin bike and everything else. And and obviously with, with MSS and people like that. And again, I was a bit like, fucking hell, you know, really? Are we at that level? And at the time, Neil was looking at putting Simon into the uh, World Endurance team. So there was Simon... John McGuinness, Michael Rutter. This is the Honda TT Legends program, legend, isn't it? Yes, yeah. And this yeah. is just before that. Yeah, yeah. So this is this this would basically be the same year. Right. So Simon was going to ride in the TT Legends team. Um and and what Neil wanted to do was he wanted us to run him in Superstock Thousand, basically because he was coming back from the injury from from the leg break. And the weird thing was, I was stood on the bank at Snetterton that day when when he went down, him and Brogy, and they had the incident and what happened happened. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, I, I was stood there and the noise of when that bike went down, it was just horrific. It just, it was different. And I remember thinking, that's not good. And Neil invited us to the to the test the day Simon rode at Snetterton, first ever time back on a bike and was the fastest out of all three. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, you know, he's come back. He's rode at the circuit that nearly finished his career and finished him as a person. And he's jumped back on the bike and he's gone faster than any of those other guys. And I remember thinking that day, you know, he he deserves it. And when Neil said to me about it, about running him in stock, I thought, yeah, I'd like to do that. But then I sort of looked at a few things and I thought, I don't know, you know, he's a bit, seems a bit of a geezer, you know. And I thought, is he going to be committed or is he literally just going to rock up, ride the bike and just like moan about everything? So, um first test we always had that test at Donington Park the weather was always shit and uh, Simon rocked up I'd only met him once before that rocked up looked around the bike and he was like nice bike this isn't it and I was like yeah and I thought that's a good start it's a good start (laughs) and uh, threw his leg over it and just did not complain or mention anything all day just rode the wheels off it and after that day I remember thinking wow what a lad, you know, what a real nice guy. He doesn't know me from Adam. He hasn't turned up, pulls hole, pull holes in anything. He just literally turned up, put his leathers on, pulled his helmet on, jumped on it and rode the wheels off it. And I remember thinking, class, I like that. Good lad. So we went to, we went to round one, Brands Hatch. And to be fair, it was, it was one of those things where we'd obviously been in a position the year before where we'd, we'd struggled, you know, We'd done everything with the bike. We'd been up, down, in, out, shim stacks, compression, everything. We'd played with everything and nothing really progressed. So um, Simon jumped on the bike 
And funny old thing, the bike was in exactly the same place as the lad who ridden it before, and he put it P2 on the grid. And we were like, mm, there's a bit of a difference here. <laughs> so, you know, we, we were buzzing. He had he had some good results on it um, through the year. Thruxton was another one. Put it on pole. And Neil, bless him, was, you know, it, it, there was a love for Simon. He, he It was almost like he was a son. You know, he, he loved him. As much as he plagued him and he used to play Neil something <laughs> chronic, he still really got on well with him. And you know, we're, me and Neil are sat there in the in the little fold out chairs at uh, at Thruxton in the Honda garage, and Neil's like, oh, "I've got a good feeling about this." He said, uh, "I think he'll be all right." What he didn't know was Simon had already said to me earlier that day, "I need to have at least a second lead when I get to the chicane on the first lap." He said, "Or it's going to go to shit." And I remember thinking, "I don't think Neil realizes how committed he's going to be on this first lap." And lo and behold, he came out of church with a second lead. And I remember thinking, he's done this, you know, he's, he'll be all right here. And he came, came out of the last chicane and there'd been a crash in the race before. And it, these little things stick in my mind, something massive. And Glenn Richard had, had high-sided on the, the Triumph um, in the race before. He'd gone down. There was a treatment on the track. I think some fuel had gone down. Um, they treated it. Simon was aware of it, you know, he knew it was there and he came out of that chicane absolutely lit and he hit the, he hit whatever it was on the track, lost the rear, up out of the seat, committed as he always was, he just kept the throttle on, but he ran out of track, similar to like what Mossy did there that year, but a bit earlier on. And I remember him going the full length of the start finish straight on the lock stops wiping out all poor Stuart Higgs boarding on the on the side <laughs> and Neil was just sat there with his head in his hands and he literally went from first place to I think about 22nd in the space of the straight at Thruxton <laughs> rejoined and finished 17th and I remember thinking not gone well there has it but it was just the type of rider he was he was just committed 100% um you know in 13 we had a great run at Cadwell um there was some shenanigans went on there with with Tristan Palmer. They'd have come in together into uh, into Charlie's one. Um, a lot unfolded that day. He collected some penalty points the weekend after when it got reviewed at uh, at Donington, and that was really the big turning point. You know, he he turned around. And he said to me, he said, "Mate, I am not built to ride a stocker." He said, "I'm sorry, I cannot ride that thing anymore." He said, "We'll do the year next year." He said. If Neil asks you to run me on a stocker, just just tell him you're not interested, and that's how straight up he was. You know, he was he was so funny; it was just brilliant. So um, I said to him, I said, "Well, you know, what are we going to do then?" I said, "We've had a good time; things have gone well." And he just he just turned around. And he went, well, "Just buy a BSB bike. We'll go BSB." And I was like, "Whoa, hang on a minute!" You know, it's not like they're in W H Smiths in in your local town. You know, you, <laughs> one you've got to find one. You've got to find a good one, and uh, and then the other thing is the running costs of it, you know, and we did not at that point have a clue of how to run a BSB bike. You know, I'd, I'd looked at them in the paddock, I'd seen them on track and that was about as close as I'd ever got to one. So I kind of spoke to Neil again and I was like, you know, he, he wants to go superbike. And Neil was like, oh yeah, you know, do you reckon it's achievable? I was like, probably not, no, but he's committed. And I went... You know, I've kind of got that connection with him now. I feel I want to do something for him. I just feel that I need to deliver something. I said, you know, whatever it takes, we'll do it. So, obviously, Neil wanted to stay on Honda at the time. You're um, on the phone of the wing commander. Is Need more help. Any base is going in the liquidation. <laughs> so, uh, so um, with with that, we we looked around. The only real the only real bike that was sort of what we felt was the right one was um, in in Woolacott. Um, you know, Rutter was complaining week in week out about the Honda that he was riding. You know, it was shit. It was slow. I need a BMW. I don't need a Honda. So, poor Ian Woolacott was like in a position where he was selling everything. So, you know, we we just straight away we we spoke to them. We went down. We picked the bikes up. And I say we, the guy who who bought the first bike is a guy called Andrew Martin. Um, Andrew's a very close friend of mine. He's in the paddock this weekend. He comes with us a lot. He owns a very small fish and chip shop in, in Swaffham. Um, 
He's also recently turned into doing donuts. He runs a. I'm so glad you brought that up because I'm, I'm, I can't, that is one of the best graphics on the side of a huge the handmade article. donut. The hand, the donut, the dink, dinky donut. Hold on, something donut, isn't it? Is yeah, it the hand, handmade donut company. Oh, it's outstanding. It yeah, looks yeah. mint. Yeah, and it's <laughs> tell you what, great job of subtly getting you uh, all your sponsors. <laughs> in. I love, it was lovely, very. Uh... That's only one side of the truck, Chrissy. We're going to work on the <laughs> yeah, other yeah, side. We, yeah, we've got another four hours yet. No, uh, so. Uh, <laughs> So and- Andrew, you know, I spoke to Andrew and Andrew got this connection with Simon as well. And I just think it was because of how nice a lad he was. And, you know, you felt you needed to help him. And Andrew was like, well, you know, he kind of talked me into it. You know, he was as gullible as what Simon was. He was like, yeah, yeah well, you know, we- we'll buy a bike and we'll-, we'll do it. So I was like, right, right. OK. And I'm now the pressure's on a bit. I'm thinking, shit, we've got to do it. So anyway, we went and bought the bike. Then we got the bike back, and you know it was a work of art. It was a proper full. Everything on it was HRC. They hadn't skimped on it, um, and we just sort of looked at it and thought, right, where do we start? Okay, Motec. Yeah, we can turn the bike on and off. What are we going to do to run that? And uh, I spoke to uh, I spoke to Tim Seed, and said to Tim, I was like, you know, Tim, I need some help with the Motec, and uh, I was like, do you know of anyone, or have you got anyone who can possibly help? And he mentioned a guy who, to be fair, I'd never heard of at the time, but he mentioned a guy called Frankie Carchady. And oh, uh, that sounds like a gangster. Yeah, to be fair, that's a fantastic name. He, you'd think he's very Italian, but he's not. He's from Louth, and he's about <laughs> as Italian as what I am. So uh, <laughs> anyway, I, I spoke to spoke to Frankie, and he's like, "Yeah, yeah, come up to come up to Lincoln. We'll meet him. My brother's got a coffee shop there. We'll meet there, and we'll discuss a few things." So. Anyway, he told me what he needed, so I rocked up there at the coffee shop, walk in, and I'm sort of looking around. There's a couple of people in there, and I'm thinking, you know, where's this this big Italian guy? And there's this this little fairly small bloke in the corner, and he's like, uh, Lee, Ciao was, Bella, yeah, 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 and he's like, Lee, I was like, uh, yeah, Frankie, and he's like, yeah, 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 like this, and I was thinking. This is not what I expected, and I was thinking it must be a wind up again. So anyway, I sat down, opened the. Uh, open the laptop and we're looking at a few bits of data and he's like, yeah, have you got the data files for that? I was like, yeah, yeah, they're all on there. They're not data files. I was like, all right, okay. And I was like, mate, I haven't got a clue about Motec. And he's like, "Mm, that's not what we need. I was like, right, okay. So anyway, we get the information you need. And I said to him, I said, like, you know, can you help us? Probably he felt sorry for us. He probably thought, and someone needs to help them because they have not got a clue. So he was like, yeah, you know, yeah, I, I, we'll do something. We'll do something. So at this point, I'm still a bit like, right, I'm on his word now. He's like, I'll do something. Something doesn't always mean everything. So I'm thinking, you know, we, we're going to jump in two feet and then we're never going to see this guy again. But, you know, fair play. He was at every round. He was there. He was working with us. And he helped us massively. He got us on the, he got us on the map. You know, he got us working. And uh, Simon loved working with him. You know, he worked with him a very short period of time because obviously he lost his life in 14 at the Northwest. Um, and that was just, that was hard. You know, we went to round one, I think it was Alton Park. We went to Alton Park. That was one of the best photos BSB have ever had when he's coming out at the last uh, turn. The thing looks at it. Yeah, it looks like a surfboard. The yeah. bike's that flat; he's just vertical over yeah, yeah. anything, and I, I, I've not seen another photo like it. Yeah, I've got, full RAF colours. It yeah, was, yeah, I've got that up in the workshop. You know, he, he signed one of them before he went, bless him, and he signed it, and it's up there in the workshop, and it's just, it's iconic. You know, you've it's got just to Google. Unreal. Listeners, listen to this now. You've got to Google that image. Yeah. It's just, yeah. It's, oh. And uh, just mentioning Frank, Frankie Cardetti there. Um, Frankie. Oh, you know him. Oh, he's pretty famous. He's pretty famous now. Frankie though. was the crew chief for Jean Mir, and uh, so like current MotoGP world champions. And uh, so, yeah, like of, of people, time. yeah, of crew chiefs in the world, he's, uh, he's pretty as, good. He's uh, as good. Well, if I, I'm not sure if any crew chief, could, uh, any other crew chief in the world could have got a Suzuki. To win the MotoGP last year, yeah. so you would have to say he's, if not the best in the world, yeah, like one of the best. And, and um, really, uh, interesting, Chrissy Rouse approved kids. Really interesting <laughs> story about Frankie is uh, he was actually wanting to get it into. So after university, he wanted to get into car racing, Formula One. His passion was, and um, as he was sort of getting towards the end of uni and sort of looking for some work experience, he went to the bank. And uh, as he was talking at the bank, he was uh, talking to the lady about what he wanted to to do. And uh, the lady 
the lady said, oh, well, my husband has a motorbike racing team. We could maybe get you some work there. And that was uh, Colin Wright's w wife. And uh, so um, put in touch Frankie with Colin Wright and ended up going on to win the British Championship numerous times, take, took him to World Superbikes. Yeah. And uh, f every interview I've heard Frankie give, he always speaks about Colin. Is it like Colin told us this and Colin told us that? And it, he basically got him into the bike racing world. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I said, was he at Cadwell Park helping you out for the the fastest ever two wheel lap? Yeah, well, he, he he popped in. He was local and he popped in. He just come and see how he was going. Um, I did see him there. I thought, I th and then I seen uh, Ryan do the fastest lap, and I thought, is that yeah. a coincidence? Or did, did he give him a few tips? He might he might have just give us a few pointers. But, is, he, uh, is, he, is he like the red form from like Batman or something? Pretty like much. That? Like, yeah, I can, yeah. Let's make it happen. Yeah, <laughs> and I can guarantee probably every time I ring him, I bet he's thinking, "Fuck, oh, what's God. he now? Yeah. You know, and. and <laughs> The connection between obviously Jake Dixon used to ride for you and uh, is Frankie's his personal manager. Was that oh, right. did Frankie put you in touch with Jake or was it? No, that how that sort of came about. Um, obviously, Frankie was with us in fourteen. He was there when we had the win at Cadwell. You know, he was he was influential in that. Um, and from that, you know, I I said to him after learning very quickly how good he actually was. You know, and he'd done a lot of work, like you say there. Going back to Colin Wright, just to quickly touch on something. Obviously, he worked with Lavia, um, Gregorio Lavia, when he rode uh, with the Airwaves Ducati team. And that was his sort of work experience. You know, he was there um, working with them, dealing with them, and did a, did a fantastic job. You know, won championships there. Then went on to what was Airwaves Yamaha with Leon Camia. Um, work with Leon. They won the title with the first year with the with the Yamaha with pretty much a standard bike from like what Frankie tells me and X Y Z. Um, so he had a great, you know, he had a good portfolio. So at the end of fourteen, you know, I said to him, I said, look, going forward into twenty fifteen, we need we need you on board. We need we want to swap from uh, from Honda to BMW, and that was something that that Pete was sort of pushing uh, Hickman when he was riding for us, um, and he. He sort of got the ride really because of what happened with with Simon, um, and at the time, Pete didn't really have loads of massive options. It um, it it sort of so I wouldn't say lost his way in BSB, but he didn't really have an option in BSB. Um, it obviously gone to the TT that year. It had a and that was with the Ice Valley team. Wasn't yes, it, it was. Yeah, yeah, Paul Shoesmith. Yeah, 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 and. Uh, and again, there was, a, you know, there's little things like a bit of a connection. Obviously, Simon was the fastest ever newcomer at the TT until Pete went. And then he did the 129 and sort of took that away from what Simon had done, the 127. Um, so, you know, we was at a point where we'd done a good send off for Simon. We, uh, we'd done something at Sneston. We had a tornado come from RFMR and fly over the grid. Um, we'd done a big day, you know, we had the we had the bike out and Connor Cummins was riding our stock bike at the time. So he paraded the, the super bike round and did a lap. Um and it it, it was worth it was a it was a real good send off. Um his family were there, everyone was there. And uh, you know, I sort of said to I said to Stuart to Stuart Higgs, I was like, you know, I was a bit we was traumatized, you know, with what had gone on, we was that close to, to Simon and it hurt, you know, stood that day at the Northwest because we was there, you know, I had Connor on the on the Sioux stop bike. Um, Simon had pestered me to take him to the Northwest that year. He was like, you know, let's go. Let's, and I said, look, you know, as much as you're riding the BSB bike, I said, I've got to run Connor. I've got the, the contract with Neil to do that with the, with the stock, stock side. I said, at the end of the day, I said, I can't afford to, to basically run two people on the roads as much as I want to. So he came back to me that year and he said to me about the, the Penns 13 team. He said, at the end of the day, he said, I have got an offer from, from, from Penns to ride for them. And he said, they're going to pay me. He said, you know, would you mind if I did it? And I said, no, I wouldn't. You know, I said, if you want to do it, you do it. I said, you're going to get paid for doing it. I said, if you went with me, you wouldn't be getting paid because what we're spending to go, we wouldn't be able to afford to do that. And he was like, right, okay, yeah, yeah. So um, so anyway, he was he was a bit gutted that he weren't doing it with us, you know, and he spent a lot of time with us at the start of the week. Um, he was always in the awning, you know, he was, he was there and we was always pally and went for a bit of food and stuff like that. And a few beers and just chilled. Um, and then obviously what happened happened. And like I say, I'd never been in that situation before. Um, it was only really our second year road racing. And yes, you know, it happens. You, when you go there, you'd be silly to think, right. Okay. It's something might not go wrong, you know, 
and it did go wrong. Um, it was quite a freak accident. You know, I spoke to Steve Plater a lot about it afterwards and basically went through McRavoy chicane uh, at the top of the hill before the run to Metropole. And he went in hot. Don't get me wrong. He was in, he was in quick. Again, he was committed. The lad was committed. And he got in, he got a bit deep, and it was at the point before they had like the the curb protection. Yes, I. And he's he's railed the curb on the way out, and he's sort of jumped the grass, landed back on the road, committed full throttle, which is the run down to Metropole is downhill the whole way until you get pretty much to the bottom as it just plateaus out. And he's gone down there, you know, second gear, third gear, fourth gear, fifth gear, sixth gear, full to the stop. And it wasn't really till he got to that point of when the bike actually plateaued and stopped pulling and then loaded the front front tire and the front tire had basically had gone flat. Um, whether it damaged the rim tire or what, we don't know. Tire had gone flat, bike got into a massive tank slapper and threw him over the front of it. And the only consolation in that whole thing was, to be fair, he was unconscious when he, when he hit the road. And that was the only consolation in the whole thing. Um, but standing there in the paddock, you know, we we stood there and Connor's come back and, you know, we're trying to sort of like deal with Connor and, and help him. And then everyone else starts to come back and you soon start to think, you, you know, like as people roll into the Northwest, they're coming in front of you, they pull into the tents. And I remember thinking, fuck, he ain't come back, you know. And then you sort of like, you think to yourself, no, he, he stopped or he's got pulled up in it, you know, he'll be behind it or something like that. And you soon start to realise things changed very quickly. The mood in the place changed very quickly. Um, and I went in to see Mervyn and I basically said to Mervyn, I said, look, you know, what's going on? I said, is it Simon? And he was like, yes, it is. He said, I can tell you that. That's all I can tell you. And I was like, fuck, that's not good. Um, the only other guy that was there was one of his best mates, Breakers. Um, and I'd got to meet Breakers through that week and we'd got really pally and, you know, it was it was big. We was like, fuck, you know, what's what's happened? And then obviously the air ambulance came in and it was a massive delay. Massive delay. Um and that was on the that was on the Saturday. Um so Saturday evening, you know, we packed up in the northwest, packed the paddock up, packed everything up. Most people tend to go straight from there to the anchor and get absolutely arsehole the fact that it's the last night of the Northwest. And it's a done thing to do, you know. You go there, you think, right we're all done Let's go and have a beer let's enjoy ourselves and then we go home and you know that was that was hard you know we fired the truck up turned around and drove straight to Belfast Royal Infirmary and you know it was just it was it was weird um and it's something you know it'll live with me I'll never ever leave me you know the feeling that day was just horrendous just horrific and you know we went to we went to to Belfast went to the hospital went in um met with breakers they let they let me in so i was there with breakers you know and we just we just sat there just beside him in the bed but the weird thing was you know like still to this day you wouldn't have thought he'd got off a motorbike at probably the best part of 200 mile an hour you know we spoke with the doctors and he he, he did there was nothing else on his body that was injured didn't have a broken toe broken finger nothing you know it just it was just the head injury that that was the issue um and the weird thing was, like, we sat there and I'm just sat there holding his hand, like, chatting to him, stuff like that. And, but he wasn't, he wasn't really sort of like connected up to anything. You know, he was sort of like still breathing for himself and stuff like that. And, you know, it's, it's pretty deep, but it's like, it, it's, it's probably what's given me the drive to do what I do in this paddock. Um, you know, I don't do it for the money. The recognition is great. Don't get me wrong. I like that. But it's to see other people progress, you know, that's the big thing. To put a smile on other people's faces is what I get my kicks from 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 doing this. And I've digressed a little bit away from the Frankie story there, but you know, it's something that I felt with this pod, I wanted to get out because a lot of people don't really know how you feel about it. You know, a lot of people just think, you know, it's just it's just racing. It's not racing, it's it's passionate. It's family, you know, it's friends, and that's what it's about. You know, it's it's deep. But, you know, sort of the end of that, 
obviously when that happened we we spoke to Stuart you know and he sort of said you know have a chat with Peter Eggman and and Pete rode that weekend at Snetterton on the on the Dave Tyson Kawasaki and you know he didn't really have a lot of options going forward and we met with Pete we sat in hospitality we had a chat with him and you know we sort of said look you know there's an opportunity there if you want to ride the bike you can ride the bike um I'm denied a bit you know and then he was like yeah go on yeah I'll, I'll ride it so he rode, I think Knock Hill might have been his first outing on it. I think he rode at Knock Hill. Um, and to be fair, it sort of like, it, it backed up some of the things that we sort of had with Simon. The first few tests of the year were, were mega. You know, I think we left the first test like seventh fastest. And, you know, me and Andrew were like, wow, fucking hell, this is easy. Why had no one else done it? You know what I mean? It was just like, fucking hell, this is brilliant. Soon we got to the first round and... Uh, and it was a wet qualifying. I remember the wet qualifying at Brands. And it's little things like this that just make me chuckle. It was a wet qualifying. He's gone out and he's peeking. He's like, we're having this. It's wet. You know, <laughs> I'm up for this. He's like, no, it'll be faster in the wet. And to be fair, he was like P2, P3. And we were thinking, fucking hell, front row. You know, we're on it, round yeah. one. Wow. Next thing you know, red flag. And he, at the time when he rode for me, he was under number six, red flag, number six, faller. And I think it's Cooper Strait. I think it is along the back of the pits. And we're like, Cooper straight? How the fuck has he fell off in a straight line? And the bike had gone down the Armaco. He's gone down the fence, you know, just proper, proper Simon, you know. He's come back to the to the box. And we were like, fucking, what's gone on? What happened? And he went, ah, there was a river running across the track. And there always is there. There's always a river coming left to right across the that bit of the straight. And um, basically what he did, he just snicked a gear as he went across it and the thing just went rap, sideways Ooh. onto the grass bang down he went but you know you couldn't you couldn't be angry with him you know he got the thing into like p3 and we were peaking you know we were just like wow <laughs> but it's, <laughs> it, it was just it was it was just brilliant and uh and like just, a, i could just imagine him saying that i i never got to meet Simon, but yeah. you know we briefly touched about it. If, if people want to know the character, just watch that TT Legends thing. You feel like you immediately turn the telly on. You feel like you've known him your entire life. And he, yeah, yeah, that MTV Cribs bit he did. You know, he's like, <laughs> like he's taking the piss out of like McGuinness's motorhome and stuff like that. He's going around. I've got a shitty fridge and stuff yeah. like that. But I can I can just imagine him walking into your own and going river mate yeah. massive river <laughs> wow <laughs> i could just imagine it's it brilliant he always loved cake you know mum would always make a cake and he'd just literally come in and he'd just stuff his face with cake you know it's just hilarious and the amount of pictures i've got of him just eating shit on a weekend was just but he was committed you know he he was one of them people that no one worked harder in the gym you know to come back from the injuries that he came from were just incredible and he'd done a lot of work with uh with red bull you know they helped him a lot and he was he was proper committed, you know. It, they had their sort of uh, athlete support, you know, helping him. And he was just there was no one more motivated to go racing and be committed. Um, and then, like I say, Pete rode the bike at uh, at Knock Hill. Um, had all right sort of run on it, but he was like, you know, this thing's fucking slow. And I was like, really? And I remember I remember Simon wrote when he rode it at Alton Park, and he was like, I think he qualified seventeenth at Alton Park, and he was like. He boxed with probably about six minutes to go in qualifying. I remember thinking, what's he come in for? And he just came in, got off it, took his helmet off, sat in the chair. And I was like, you're right. He's like, mate, I've got nothing left, nothing left. And I was like, really? <laughs> he was like, I've had the thing, two wheel drifting around Island Bends. He said, I'm out of control. He said, I thought I'd better park it. He said, if not, we're going to be collecting it from the other side of the car park. And I was like, really? He was like, yeah. He was like, she feels a bit slow. And I was like, all right, okay. And uh, after Pete rode it, like I say, at Knock Hill and sort of backed up that, we were, we then did some work with it. And we kind of found out really quickly that probably the engines that we'd got with the bike weren't quite as maybe spec'd up and as good as what we believed they were. Um, this is still the, the ex-Rutter bike at this yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, All yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. So either it was that shit when Rutter rode it, and to be <laughs> fair, he, you know, he might have been right, or to be fair, he was just, just slow. But uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it it was just, you know, Simon used to rib him about it because obviously when he finished P7 at the first test and I think Rutter was behind him, he never let it go. Never <laughs> let it go. Um, and Rutter's got a good sense of humour as well. So they, uh... <laughs> at times. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it, and Pete sort of backed that up. So first thing we did, we was like, and, and Andrew is one of those guys that, you know, if he's putting a bathroom in at home, 
everything has to be right. Whatever he does in life has to be right. You know, with the, with the donut side of things, it had to be right. You know, those donuts, like, they knock spots off Krispy Kreme. Honestly, I will bring you a box. He's next. on commission, Chrissy. I'm not. I wish <laughs> get I was. That in, get that I in. Will bring you, I will bring you a box, and then you can tell me how good they hey, are. Hey, don't promise now, Jürgen. Don't promise now. We'll honestly, want a box. honestly, I will. I know Chrissy will be a bit like, oh, a bit heavy for me. You know, I'm on a racing diet, but... Trust, come on, trust me. Trust Where's me. the road racer? So, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so then you know we went straight to Chris, Chris Mayhew, and we did a lot of work with engines, a lot of work, and 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 in a way, Pete sort of like he, he reaped the reward of that, you know, and it gave him a great opportunity. It put him back on the map, you know. That win at, at win at Cadwell, he'd never won a BSB race before, you know. He'd never won a BSB race, and we definitely had never ever won a BSB and, race. And, and at this point, Pete aitman has been in BSB since he was seventeen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was you that, know, was that that same race Gary Mason was on the podium uh, well, for do, do, Dave do, do, Tyson's do. team? No, was that not here? When, uh, I can't remember. That was a Cadwell as well, a wet was race it? Cadwell. That's Whoa, all I, I can't remember. There was some rain coming down that day. That it night, was bad. It? But yeah. to be fair, you know, it, it was one of them that sort of flitting backwards and forwards. When I spoke to Shaky about doing the deal with with, with Dixon, because he was his manager at the time, and I said oh, to him, right. I said, uh, what about the Cadwell Park race? And yeah, you know, I, I backed it off about halfway through. You know, I just thought Pete's nowhere with me in the championship and I've got a championship to think about. To be fair, I was stood on pit wall that day, and that bloke, that number sixty-seven, was putting purple sectors in everywhere. Hick, uh, that from that race, Hickman had the fastest wet uh, wet lap of Cadwell Park. I yeah, think it yeah. was either a thirty-six or a thirty-eight. It was unreal. In the wet, unreal, full wet. Yeah, I think it was thirty. Can you I remember? Can't, it was I like can't remember. I look back now. Yeah. You say that, but it was it was impressive. You know, I think he was like four point two seconds ahead of Shaky at one point in the race, and I give Shane the do middle of the race. I thought. We're, we're done for he pulled it back to I think about 1.2 and uh, Dave Hickman Pete's dad always used to do the pit board and he used to make me piss because if he had 1.2 <laughs> it'd give him like 0.3 you know and I'm like Dave it's wet he's going to fucking push and he was like we need him to push if not he's going to lose it and I'm like yeah but you know we've got a bit more of a gap than that and he'd always like reduce the gap, Good you know. Lad. And I can imagine probably by this point, Pete's used to the gap, and he's probably thinking, "I've got one point three. Well, you know, you know. Dad, <laughs> it's him out, yeah. Lo- loads of people have done that. I would hate that if someone wasn't no, giving me my go- actual gaps. Yeah. I've, uh, uh, when I first started racing, I remember one of my mates' dads always used to do that. And if you had a big gap, you would give him a small one to keep him on his toes. <laughs> I imagine if, I, if you crashed, and yeah. as you go down the road, you look behind and you had you had like ten seconds. Yeah. Oh, I'd, I, I want to know exactly what yeah. like what they, what it is. You're uh, calculated though. So you're yeah. calculated. And like I say, he, he pulled it in and he was pushing. I remember thinking, fuck, we're not we're not gonna do it, we're not gonna do it. And now it's like turned from a race win, it's almost like a championship to us. Do you know what I mean? And to be fair to Pete, he he pulled it out and it's in the gap coming down. Excuse me, it's in the gap coming down, and he responded and he went again. And I remember thinking, this thing's not coming home at this point. And you know, probably it was deep into the race when he's when he done that time because the rain eased a little bit it was heavy sort of to start the race to to mid and then it eased a little bit um and it's another iconic picture i've got up in the workshop we're all on pit wall probably over pit wall to be fair um and he's on the back wheel on the start finish straight at cadwell and we all know pete loves a wheelie and to be fair he's picked the thing up coming out of barn and he's on the back wheel and i remember thinking jesus christ you know there's there's water everywhere and I thought he fucking aquaplanes and don't make the line and then I remember, think, I remember thinking they're far enough ahead if he does it he's ass. he's probably going to slide over anyway do you know what I mean but um, it's just another one of those iconic pictures and there's there's Dave and you can see the pit board still with the numbers on it like P1 like plus nothing do you know what I mean no, it's more than that don't get me wrong it's more than that but it weren't the gap it was and it just you look at them and you think fucking, they were good days you know that it's little snippets in, in your life that that really stay with you. And did he take the pit board tactic over when he got Jake on board then? <laughs> no, to be to be fair, I'm one of them people, you've got what you got, you know. Yeah. It, it, you you need to know what's behind you and where they are behind you. Yeah. In, in terms of rider lineup, so af- from uh, so Simon and then Peter, Peter Hickman, did you go straight to Alistair Seeley, Jake? No, no. Who in I, 15, uh, at the end of 14, Pete was like, you know, we need to look at going to BMW. If I had a faster bike, would be winning. And I'm like, okay, okay. 
And I'm thinking, fucking hell, we've gone from not being a BSB team to now being a BSB team to now change the manufacturer all within the space of two years. So, you know, we were kind of hooked a bit. You know, we was at this point, we were hooked. You know, we'd, we'd, got, the, we'd got the bug. And uh, and Andrew was like, well, you know, is it going to cost a lot to go to BMW? And I was like, I don't really know. But to be fair, I don't know how we managed to blag it because obviously REF, German... But we did, you know, we, we got a good deal from, from BMW. So we bought some bikes, we prepped them up, built them, built them as a super bike. And to be fair, that year pretty much nearly killed me because that was the, we bought the Arctic, you know, the plan was in the winter to build the Arctic to what we've got now. So it's all, was this the Briggs bike? No, uh, no, it was Briggs on the roads. Yes, that was it. I remember. Yeah, Br- yeah I remember Briggs was Briggs. on it. Yeah, yes, it was Royal Air Force so and it. Briggs equipment. Yeah. There we go. Yes, I. Yeah. Um, so in BSB, it was blue, red, white, and blue. Um, but on the roads at that time, because all of the publicity, every picture pretty much that came out of Simon um, was in RAF leathers. And you know, the thing with the RAF was they were a bit like you know we've got to be careful from that side of it. You know, bits and pieces. So. When we said we was doing the roads again, the Northwest, the TT, they kind of, the Ulster, the Macau Grand Prix, they kind of were like, well, okay, yeah, we, you know, we want to, but... Let's be respectful about what yeah. they are, yeah. So Briggs were like, okay, we'll put a bit more money in. They've got um, they've got places in Northern Ireland. So for them, you know, the Northwest was a big thing. So we went in the silver and white colour. Um, so on the roads, we ran under just Briggs equipment. That was it. Um and you know what a year! So we we built the Arctic, we bought the BMs, we we converted to superbike. Frankie was still on board; he was still helping out. Um, so again, that year, what did we do that year? We had two second places at Cadwell. Um, Pete put it on the box there twice in a weekend. And I'm trying to think what else we did in the year. I think we had a couple of other. I think we had one other podium. I think we were running the roads with Hickman as well. Yeah, so we was doing the roads with Hickman, and you know. I was nervous about that a bit. I was a bit like, you know, he's gone there, he's done 129 mile an hour. Fucking hell, you know, what, what's it going to be like? You know, he's obviously going to want to go there and deliver. So, but the good thing with Pete, you know, we, we spoke about it long and hard and we were like, right, you know, what are we going to do? What are we building? What are we taking? And he was like, you know, I'm still learning. He went, you know, let's just build a stocker, a good stocker. I'll ride that in the super stock. I'll ride it in the super bike. And, and that's what we did. So um, we built we built a stocker. Um, he missed the northwest, had a big crash at Druids in the wet, lost the front on the brakes into Druids, went down, railed into the barriers really hard. And again, it's one of their moments that you don't really, when you look back at it, you think, fucking hell. To be fair, that incident, and how well published he's made it, I don't know. One, he's lucky to be alive, and two, he's lucky to be walking, because he came out of that incident. He went to um, he went to the medical centre, and he was fast that weekend. He was he was at the sharp end, and he's come out of the medical centre. He's walked back to the garage, and uh, we've re- we've rebuilt the bike, and we're like, you know, how are you feeling? He's like, oh, fucking, I'm battered. He went, but I'll be all right. I'll be all right to race. He went, fucking, hell, my neck is stiff. So. You know, we were a bit like, you know, you need to get checked out. The medical centre wanted him to go to Crew Hospital to get checked. He went to Crew Hospital. Me and Andrew went there to um, to pick him up. Dave went with him. He rang me, fuck, I can't remember what time it was, he rang me late. And he's like, right, I'm discharging myself. They're pissing around. They're not doing this. They're not doing that. I'm discharging myself. We'll be right for qualifying tomorrow. So um, me and Andrew went over there. We got there and he was he was white as a ghost you know and I remember looking at I said to Andrew we nipped off and went to the toilet and I said mate he does not look good and Andrew was like I don't think we ought to be taking him away from here and I was like no I don't so we had a chat Pete convinced himself he was okay anyway we bring him home or back to the track get back to the track put him in his motor home you know his ribs were sore he was struggling to breathe a bit but he was adamant he was riding on on Saturday so he's in the motor home Next thing you know, I get a phone call in the morning. First thing, he's like, Lee, I ain't riding today. And I was like, I didn't think you would be, mate. He's like, no. Basically, he said the the hospital have called and they found something on the x-ray and I broke one of my vertebrae. And basically what they've told me to do is to walk from my motorhome or get someone to go for me, 
get a neck brace, put a neck brace on, and literally just immobilize myself and get back to hospital because it's at that point where potentially it could be, you know, could be life threatening. And at that point, we were like, "Fucking hell!" So anyway, he's he, he's took himself to the med center. He's got, do a lap, Pete. One yeah, lap. See how you feel. One lap. Right. Do a lap. So he's gone to the med center. He's got himself a neck brace. He's turned up at the garage, and we're like, "Wow, you know, mate, what are you doing?" If someone like bangs into you or whatever. So anyway, getting back to hospital, and he's broken his neck. So he, he, he was pretty adamant that he'd make the northwest, and we were like, "Ain't happening." You know, you've got like a week and a half normally between Alton and and start of northwest. So. He missed the Northwest. How he rode at the TT, I don't know. You know, the abuse, the, you know the, what the it's wit, like. The, wit, the wind pressure on your neck is yeah. just beyond in the batter. Fair play. Yeah. <laughs> and he's got a big head as it is, hasn't he? You know, so he would have got extra buffing. Six buff foot in. in the neck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he'd have got extra buffing. So, you know, and we went to the TT and I was a bit nervous about that. I'm thinking, you know, this isn't him. You know, this isn't right. But he, he said he felt right to ride, you know, and Pete's one of them guys, he wouldn't if he didn't feel right, he wouldn't ride. Um even though he thought he was gonna ride on Saturday at Alton Park. But um <laughs> damn, but you know damn we, medical professionals <laughs> we, telling him he's gonna broke it. <laughs> we we went out and he was methodical, you know, he approached it professionally, he built into the into the week and everyone thought he was gonna rock out and he'd do a one thirty, you know, in practice, and he didn't. And he took a bit of time to get back to where he was. He got to that point and he stayed at that point and didn't really sort of progress too much further. But we knew what had gone on, you know, in a few weeks prior to that and thought, you know, for me on the roads, there's no pressure. At the end of the day, I go there because it's exciting. It's the only place like the TT where you can actually be involved as a team. You know, here... You're involved, you build a bike, you prepare a bike, but when it goes out, you don't see it again for another, say, 20 laps, and then it comes back, and it's like, well done. You know, your rider's delivered. But the TT, when that thing comes into the pit stop, I remember 13... Every two laps. <laughs> the, fir- the first year we go to the TT in 13, you know, I said to, like, the Honda guys, I was like, fucking hell, we've got to do a pit stop, haven't we? And they were like, yeah, yeah, you're up for that. And I was like, yeah. And then like, who's changing the wheel? I was like, I best. And they're like, right, okay, yeah, do you want to practice? And I was like not really and they were like yeah you need to practice and I was like no nah, you don't really I said it's I'd rather just do it I said because if you practice you're then trying to do it quicker and quicker and quicker I said I just want to do it right I said I just want to do it right and I remember the first ever time I did it it was just like it was surreal he's come into the box everything's laid out I've got all my tools laid out there I've got the wheel there ready you know <laughs> I've got a spare spindle just in case and I've took the wheel out put the wheel in and I remember while I was doing it I could not hear a thing I couldn't even hear the bikes going by I couldn't hear like the siren going couldn't hear the grandstand and you know it just did not hear a thing and I remember putting the wheel in rotating it to get the chain on tighten up click click down fuel done go and then for some reason, I remember thinking to myself, did I put the chain on? You know, and it was just like, the weird thing was, after he'd left, it was like, wow, have I just done that, you know? And the feeling that you get as a mechanic, as much as, like, you're shitting yourself, it's the feeling of being involved in a result, you know, and it's the, it, it's a lot of the pit stops at the TT win and lose a race as well. You oh, know, it's, it's crucial. It's, tight. it's crucial. And, you know, I peak off that sort of thing. When you're there and, you know, and someone will come in and you're like, Arr! the siren goes and you're like, fuck, who's this, who's this? And someone will come in, it'll be McGuinness. And they're always slick, do you know what I mean? They're in, the old windy gun, it's going and you're like, yes, you know, and you're like watching them and you're like, come on, come on, come on, right, it's going. And when the thing fires up, the whole grandstand lights up, and everyone's cheering and it's, it's only a bike sign, do you know what I mean? And then you remind but, yourself, in another two laps, I've got to do it again. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, you know, it's... <laughs> It's just amazing. It's bit, having that involvement, which is, I think, with the, the TT, what's so iconic and different. So, you know, so we're building up in 15. Pete's going well. And uh, and I think it must have been the stock race, first race. And, uh, you know, everyone's now talking about it. Oh, you know, Peter Hickman, we thought he'd have done 130 by now in practice and this, that and the other. And then, fuck me, he went out. And I think he forgot about joining the 130 club. He just literally went to 131. I think it was 131.5. And it was just like, wow, where has that come from? You know, and he just he just 
develop. He just broke into it, you know, got to that point and just bang, it was there. It was just unreal. And we had a good we had a good year that year on the road. Um I think we finished a senior on a stock bike. He was eighth fastest. Um finished in eighth eighth fastest as well, you know, it was just it was mega. Um we went to the Ulster Grand Prix, won the Dunrod race there, upset loads of people. It was just brilliant, you know, like the, the I remember the the engine had not been out of the frame. We got dynoed at the TT after the stock race with a sticky Dunlop tire in. And the thing was like 210 horsepower. You know, it was just unreal. It was just a weapon. Um, we must have got the Monday bike, not the Friday bike. And the Ulster, like I say, won the Dunrod race there. And I didn't go to the Ulster. Um, I stayed at home. And it's the only race I've ever missed. And I was in the. I remember being in the garden. I've got the radio on. I'm listening to it. And I'm thinking, fucking hell, Pete, take it steady, take it steady. And Hickman's in the lead, and I'm thinking, fucking hell, what's he doing in the lead? You know, just take it steady. And get then, the pit board out, get the pit yeah, board out, pull him yeah, in, pull him in, pull yeah. him in. Yeah, and he, he won the Dunrod race, and he, I think he podiumed the stock race as well. You know, he had a, he had a great Ulster. Um, and then obviously from there that year, we was, we'd done Macau 2014 with McGuinness. Um, and how that all sort of came about, John and Simon obviously were great, were great mates. Simon said to me, Mate, we always we need to go to Macau. He's like, I want to take you to Macau. You'll love it. He's like, it's brilliant. You know, it's just it's just amazing. Never got that opportunity. And then when McGuinness rang me and was like, mate, you know, you got a Honda. Honda, I'm going this year. Can I ride it? You know, and I was just like, wow, yeah, let's do it. You know, and uh, and to be fair, Pro Bolt did a great job. Pro Bolt came in with the sponsorship. Um, we had a big Pro Bolt Honda on the front, the leathers, the bike, everything. It, lo- it looked proper, all carbon, just with the Pro Bolt yellow logo. It was mega. Um, and the first year we were there, we teamed up with Lee Johnson. So John and Lee rode together, both on Hondas. We won the team championship the first time we went. And then 15, obviously, went back with with Hickey. Um, again, he'd been there the year before with Paul Shoesmith. Mm. Unfortunately, had an off and didn't make the race. Tried everything in the world to make the race, but didn't. Um, and, you know, we we knew we was in a fairly good position going there with with Pete. He was He was fast there. Um, safe but fast um, was, and again our biggest contender was going to be Martin Jessup we was in the same oh the I king of McKay is so was, fast around there oh mate he's unreal isn't he he's just on rails around that place yeah it's, and it's, I get on really well with James um, and the guys you know all the guys that were with Martin he's, he's they're a good laugh you know get on really well so there was some great banter <laughs> and um, and you know Icky's rolled out there and he was just fast straight from the get go we was on Dunlop, they were on Metzler, you know, so it was like a tyre war as well. It was brilliant. And, you know, Martin had a little bit on us in pace. In, in in a one lap, he was fast, you know, very fast. But we knew that basically he couldn't do a lot more than probably about eight laps. And, uh, and the tyre was basically just rooted. We were strong the whole way through. And um, and we'd done a run in the, in the warm-up um, on old tyres. And we were we were faster. We knew we'd got good pace. And Pete said to me, he said, I need to be on his ass. Like, by San Francisco Hill, I've got to be behind him. He's going to pull a gap. I'm not going to stress. I'm just going to sit there. Then we'll go. Um, and that's pretty much what happened, you know. And it could, I think it could have gone a different way. We got to Lisboa. Rutter made a small error. We dipped under, underneath him, come up the hill behind Jessup. And I'd got a uh, a friend of mine who was working at Marham at the time, Um and he'd never ever been road racing in his life. First place he'd ever been road racing. I took him to Macau. Yeah, the, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we literally we spent the whole flight just annoying everyone on the plane, just drinking shit wine and watching like Amoy, Northwest, everything. Just watching all these DVDs on the yeah, laptop. Watching it, watching every road race going. Macau's nothing <laughs> like this at all. It's hot, sunny. And, it's... <laughs> and he's like, Lewis is one of them people that he's into his lap times. He's into his statistics. You know, he loves all that sort of stuff. And, you know, we're sat in the hotel room. We're like, you know, I think we've got this. You know, I think Jessup's going to be here. We're going to be there. You know, it's going to be tight. It's this, that, and the other. And we're like peaking, you know, we've gone down race day. And uh, and he's pulled it out of the bag. You know, he's, he's, he's behind Jessup. And... Jessup, bless him, was riding the wheels off the thing. And when he saw that coming, I think he was like, he probably pulled about 3.4 seconds on us. And then it started coming down and it came down quick. And he must have just thought, fuck it. You know, it's Hickman, I know it is. And 
and like I say, we're still on the we're still on this this stock sort of uh, BMW that was fast, and he's he's come down the uh, he's come down the run to Lisboa behind uh, behind Jessup. He said, "I pulled out the slipstream." Soon realised I weren't going past because as soon as I pulled out, I went slower. So he said, "I dropped back in and just thought, right, you know, I'm having him on the brakes in Lisboa." Done him there, pulled away, and just literally just smashed it. And like for us to go to Macau second time ever and to win the thing, you know, it's just it's just unreal, just literally unreal. On the roads, he was just incredible. So developing from there to to sixteen was was obviously when we took Alistair on BMW still. Frankie's still involved, so we've got Alistair on board. And uh, that was all also as well. A lot of that was around the Northwest with the Briggs equipment commitment still. You know, mm. we looked at that and Briggs were like, you know, we, we want to win the Northwest. So we was like, right, okay, we need to look at Alistair Seeley then. So we looked at Alistair and he didn't really have any options in BSB. Um, you know, he's, and he's performed in BSB before. So we yeah. thought, you know, we'll have, a, we'll have a punt on it. You know, we'll, we'll see what happens. So we took him on and... Uh, I think Alton Park first round. I think he had a fifth. Um, DNF race two, unfortunately. Clipped the curb at, at Shell Hairpin. Because he was so small, he used to have such lean angle. Like, ridiculously lean angle. Just to get his knee on the deck. Yeah. <laughs> he never used to really get his knee down. That was the weird thing. And uh, I think he had a set of knee sliders for about four years before he wore them out, bless him. <laughs> but um, he, clipped, he clipped either the grass or the curb on the inside and went down. And uh, But the thing is, from there, you know, it just shows like our commitment as a team. I left there on the on the Monday evening. I'm driving back in the truck because I drive the race truck, and I'm trucking back 56 mile an hour. So I've got all the time in the world, you know. And nine times out of ten, you like someone giving you a call and pick see the phone, Alistair. And I'm thinking, all oh, right, okay. So I'm having a chat with him. Yeah, Northwest next week. I think I need to take the super bike. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's not the deal, you know. We weren't going with the BSP bike. Yeah, well, you know, look how Alton's gone. You know, I you know if I've got the BSP bike. I've, walk it you know I'm king around there and this that and the other so um like an idiot you know rather than just putting my foot down and going no you've got two bikes built with the workshop ready to go all the spares are there that's the deal like an idiot I went yeah yeah all right then yeah I'll build you a super bike so I got back to the workshop then I built him a super bike for for the northwest and uh we had a podium in the stock race didn't deliver in the super bike we had a few issues and bits and pieces um and then things just didn't really click back in BSB. We started to drop off a bit. Results weren't really there. Um, so at this point, I'd already spoken to Shaky about Dixie at the end of 15. I was like, you know, I'd, I'd like to do something with him. And, you know, fair play. You know, Shane came back to me and said, look, we want to win the 600 championship. We want to win that Super Sport championship before we move on. We need a title. He was on the ourselves. triumph at that point. Was that right? Yeah, Smith's. Smith's triumph, wasn't he? Yeah, yes. at that point, yeah. And then yeah. the beginning of 2016, he was with Dave Tyson on yeah. the Qingdao. On the MV. That yeah, was the, it, yeah. yes. I, yeah. I. Um, and, you know, Shane said to me, you know, we want to win that championship. And then when I saw what was announced, and I just thought, you know, I don't know if the MV is the right bike for it. But, you know, I didn't comment on it anyway. And 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 that's that's by the by. And then next thing you know, I'm sat there watching a, a World Superbike uh, meeting. I can't remember where it was. And I'm sat on the sofa at home. Next thing you know, the phone's going off. Message, Jake Dixon. I'm thinking, all right, okay. So I pick it up and there's this message like, you know, things aren't working right. I want to move on, you know. You need to put me on a superbike, and I'm like, "Fuck you know, here we go again." You know, I'm gullible enough as it is, and as soon as someone says that, I get all giddy, and I think, "Oh yeah, yeah, yeah." So uh, he knew I'd probably got the break and strain of a Kit Kat by this point. You're gonna have like 50 <laughs> messages after this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. guaranteed. Yeah, like everyone in the paddock. Yeah, yeah. you need to. I'm up for it. Back. I'm up for it. Don't worry, lads. I'm up for it. So, uh, so you know, uh, <laughs> hang on, the phone's gone off. Chris, you can have a superbike. <laughs> Your message is already. So, uh, you know, it's um, it's one of them. So uh, I sort of like, I, I bluffed it and I was like, no, nah, you know, you know, you're doing a good job there. You know, you've had a podium, you know, just keep your head up, you know, just keep plugging away. People will respect you for it. Don't leave the team, you know, and just really sort of tried to big him up and make him stay. And the messages just kept coming. He said, well, basically, he said, if you don't put me on one, someone else is going to. And I was like, fucking hell. And I was like, you know, I've chased this kid. I was like, I need to stand up to my word here and I need to give him an opportunity. And we had the the two-day test coming up at SNET that we always used to have. So anyway, the end of the messages, I said to him, I said, look, I'll put you on a bike at SNET. 
I'll build you a super bike because I had the spares from the Northwest and everything else. I said, but no promises, you know, no promises. Just come along, have fun, ride the bike, and let's see how things go. So anyway, he rocked up. And to be fair, he was different. You know, he was quite quiet. He was he, he was professional, got on, did his job. His dad came. Um, Frankie was there working with us, you know. And uh, I'd sort of blown a bit of smoke up his ass to Frankie and was like, you know, we need need to keep an eye on this. I was like, you know, don't just let him just do his own thing. You know, we need to be on top of him. We need to make sure we're, we're, we're doing right because, you know, we don't want to miss an opportunity. Um and again, you know, he just plugged away, got quicker and quicker and quicker. And the next thing you know, he's faster than Alistair. And you could see that it was a bit tetchy, you know. Alistair's a bit like, fucking hell, you know, who's this kid sort of thing. And then next thing you know, Alistair put one over the fence at turn one. And it was just like, yeah, okay, this might not have gone as well as we thought it was going to go. Um, so- I remember that weekend. It was, it was quite funny because obviously at the time, Shaky was uh, Jake's manager. And uh, Shaky actually crashed at the hairpin and t- sort of took Jake out of the uh, race. Knock Hill. Yeah, 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 his first, yeah, yeah, first yeah. race on the super, this- super bike. So the, they were both ended up on the ground. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was this but- on the Kawasaki or the, it was on was the, on the BM, BM at the time? It was on the BM at the time. Before but, uh, yeah, as a sort of de- a debut in the super bike class, he was, he was pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah, he right? was. Yeah, really, really impressive. And that, you know, and that sort of, sort of like from Snetterton, you know, after there, I spoke to Frankie and I said, look, you know, what, what do you think? And he was like, mate, kid's got something. He said, he's breaking traces. He said, and throttle traces, he said, are just unreal. He was like, you've got to put him on one. I was like, fuck's sake. I was like, did you really have to say that? He's like, <laughs> you need to, you need to. He was like, get it done. And I was like, right. Okay. So I spoke to, I spoke to, uh, to Briggs and I said to them, I was like, you know, it, it's hard when you go back to a sponsor and go, any chance of a little bit more money and you know i told him what was happening he's a prospect for the future blah 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 and yeah they came on board they put a bit of money in um which was a massive help you know i don't want to sound disrespectful for that it was a massive help and if it if it wasn't there we probably wouldn't have been able to do it and again you know donut man says to andrew you know, we've got some money, but we ain't got enough. And he was like, well, you know, we'll see how Knock Hill goes. You know, he's like, and then, you know, we'll make a decision and see what's going to happen. And I sort of thought, fucking hell, you know, is is that a commitment or, or what? Um, but, you know, we spoke and I said to him, I said, but we need we need a contract sign before he gets on that bike at Knock Hill. I said, because if he gets on it and delivers, every Heaven. man and his dog in that paddock are going to want to sign him. And if we ain't got a pen on paper you know, we're screwed. So I said to Shane, who was managing him at the time, I said, look, you know, Shaky, I said, we need to get this sorted out. So anyway, we sent the contract over. There was a few little bits and pieces, nothing major. And to be fair, working with Shane was not what I expected. I honestly expected that he would have been hard work, but Mm. he was mega. You know, he put stuff in the contract that I hadn't got in there, which helped us as a team. You know, it was just unreal. Stuff that I still have in there now. Um, and and like I say, he was very very good with the advisory role and and how he went about it. So anyway, we we done the deal, and it was a non it was non paid. Um, but he wasn't putting anything into us, and we wasn't paying him. We was just literally running the bike, crash damage, everything. He was just turned up and riding it. Um, I think he brought. In fact, I think he brought a little bit. I think he brought a little bit, um, which he brought across just to sort of like help out. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, we went to Knock Hill. Debut was just unreal. It was just like, wow, okay, that's not what we expected. He was, he was, he was fast. And like you said, Chris, you know, it was an incident at the uh, at the hairpin. Shaky lost the front, went down. Dixie grabbed a handful of brakes to try and miss him. Went over the front, did miss him, you know, but went down. And I don't really know what possessed him, but probably because it was the bike that it was, he was like, "Fuck, I need to pick it up." So. He's grabbed hold of it to pick it up, and Josh Wainwright, that was it. I was trying to think of the lad's name the other day. Josh Wainwright, yeah, come round the hairpin and just literally railed him, and he just sent him flying. And I remember thinking, fuck, that is not good, not good. And he's down in the track on his back. They've stretched him off, and I think, oh, fucking hell, this is, this is not what we wanted, you know, first ever time out. And it looked very serious. It did look very serious. The noise of it, it was just like, it was just awful. But um, luckily, he hadn't done too much damage. He was just really battered and bruised, you know. He hadn't broken anything. Um, 
but the bruising just came out so quick. I remember going to the motorhome and he was just like, he was black. And, um, and with that, you know, we weren't expecting a lot, you know, even if he was going to ride, but he did ride, you know, I just, I don't know how you lot do it. You know, you're mental, you know, you get to that point where you're badly injured, you know, you're hurt and you're like, yeah, still do this and still pull something out. You know, it's just unreal. So he rode, he did well, he got results and, and had a good year, you know, did over expected, you know, above and beyond of what we thought in, in his first ever year, really with Superbike. Um, unfortunately didn't end well. You know, he had a big incident at Alton Park, not his fault, not his fault. And basically what he had, he had a brake failure at Alton Park at Britain Chicane. Um, and it was fast. It was when the runoff, there was no runoff, you know, the tyre barrier was literally at the side of the circuit. And, excuse me, he uh, he broke his hip. Similar sort of thing, I think, to what probably Danny Kent's done at the moment, mm. you know, and when he went into the, to the hospital, they were like, you know, this is a serious injury. I could not believe that Danny Kent was walking around a, a, a snack, you know, I was like, wow. And, and anyway, sort of Dixie recovered, you know, over the winter, it was the end of the year. So he, he sat the last two out, recovered over the winter. Um, and you know, we that was when we made the swap from BMW to to Kawasaki for 2017, and we discussed, you know, what we was going to do. Um, we released Alistair from his contract at the end of the year, and he went on to do other things. Um, resigned uh, Jake, and again, that was we had a lot of in, influence probably on that with with Frankie again. You know, I spoke to him long and hard, said, you know, what do you think? At the time, the BM was it was fast. It, it, it was a good bike on the brakes, but we just sort of like it struggled in some places. Um, the chassis just seemed it just seemed like not what you needed really for BSB. So we knew probably the Kawasaki weren't going to be the fastest bike out there, but it was going to be a bit of an all rounder. You know, it, it would work in a lot of places. So start of seventeen, we off we go to the protest, um, and this you know for me. This was a baptism of fire because at this point, I've got Leon Haslam's ex crew chief, um, Leon Haslam's ex data guy, and it's all what you know. Me and Frankie have discussed, and we're like, right, we need that. He needs that support. He needs them people behind him, and you know, he's going to be his like, you know, major con- championship contender. So, if we get that, we're halfway there. We go to the protest. You know, Dixie's coming back from a broken hip. He's not the best at injuries, you know. He's like world's ended if he's like pulled a fingernail off. And we've come back, so we've gone out at Cartagena. And to be fair, I think if I put it bluntly, we we were shit, you know. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm sort of sat there. <laughs> you feel like Alice in Wonderland? You've jumped down the rabbit hole. You're thinking, oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm thinking, what have I done? You know, I don't know what's happened over this winter, but he's lost what he had, and. I didn't ever say it to him, but I thought it, you know, because it was just like such a night and day difference. Um, And he crashed at turn one, I think probably in the first session, but not really through his fault. You know, we had loads of push. The bike was pushing. The electronics weren't right. He went down. um, Sorry, he went down at the last turn first. That's where he went down about four laps in. He went down at the last turn. Then he went down at the uh, turn one. Um, still on the first day, we're not we're not even at lunch. We're not even at a sangria by this point, you know. We've not even got to lunch, and um, and with that, you know, the Kawasaki's what I've learned since. If they go down the road, they just suffer so much with oil pressure to the point where now, if we put a bike down the road, we clutch out, we reprime it, and it's just scary how long it takes to get the oil pressure back, and it's just a trait of the Kawasaki's. Um, and that's what that's what they are, you know. And again, that was something that Jeb said to me. And at the time, it probably hadn't really been discussed because we've gone to Kawasaki, we're going to the protest. Jeb wasn't building the engines at the time, you know. I hadn't approached him at this point to build the engines. Someone else was building the engines. And anyway, he's gone down the road. It's not been primed. It's just been fired up and run. So we get to we get to nearly to lunch. Next thing you know, he, he boxes and he's like, Fuck, you know, I don't know what's going on with that. He said, It sounds awful. Literally fired it up and it was like a metal tin with a load of spanners in it. It was just like dang 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 dang. I just looked at the guy who built the engine, he was a crew chief, and went, What do we do now? You know, and you just said there at the start of this, credit to you for getting that engine done in forty minutes. 
I have got more spares in my workshop now, probably than most of these teams put together. And it's just because, because of said crew chief. <laughs> because of said crew chief. Uh-huh. You know, and you have to have that. You have to have that sort of stuff in, in your locker. And click, buy, deliver. With remote purchasing from the two time motorcycle news dealer of the year, Colchester Kawasaki. Proud sponsors of Chasing the Race In. Can you remember the last sun. race to get into yeah, the yeah. was here? Yeah, yeah. There was only a, thanks to Christian. There was like seven seven riders that finished the race. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who was it? Linfoot won it, I think, in the West. Oh, I can't and remember. Like, literally, and nearly every single person crashed. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, Lee Jackson, I think, was last, and he was sixth. Yeah. Uh, oh, and, what a, what and the a... thing was in that race, you know, and this is like I look at other teams in the paddock as well, and like all Christian's got to do is I can stay on the thing. You know, and he was flying. He was literally, he was flying. And I remember I said to, again, Andrew was there and he was like, we're not in, are we? And I went, we'll be in, don't you worry. And he's like, what do you mean? And I went, the way he is pushing, he's not going to finish the race. And next thing you know, down the road on the new, on the, down by the wing, wing, literally by the wing. And Dixie said, as I came round, because we had nothing, we had nothing for him that day. He was fast. Mm. He was fast. And why the team weren't boarding him, you know, okay, okay, just back it off, you know, just finish. I think he had Hickman's dad on his pit board. Plus Did he? Zero. I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he <said> <laughs> yeah, it would surprise me, good old Dave. I knew he'd come back to help us. I was just keeping him on his toes. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Dixie said he came round that corner on that straight, he said, and I see the thing going round and round and round and round. He said, he just literally stood up and he said, I thought, fuck, he's Christian. And he said, I've never had so many moments after I saw him stood in the middle of the track. He said, like, just the the slight, it just was unreal. He said, I knew straight away we're in the showdown. And he said the thing, he said, I was just losing the front everywhere after that. He said, I don't know how I finished myself. Mm -hmm. It was a, it was bad conditions. Um, So we made the showdown in 17, even though, even though the start to the year we had was horrific. Mm -hmm. Um, A brilliant achievement for you, um, first year with Jake in the championship yeah. and just quickly on that su- subject uh, when this podcast goes out everyone will know who's made the top eight now it was top six back then but right now we've got two races tomorrow Yeah. yeah. Uh, at the moment uh, we've got the the bottom two places are filled by uh, Lee Jackson and Bradley Ray yeah. I think it's um, sorry Br- uh, Bradley Ray's Bradley who's ahead of Bradley Ray at the moment <laughs> Lee Jackson. Last. It was, no, Lee, it was, it was it's, um, but Lee broke down today, didn't he? Lee yeah, there's, there's, there's two people that are sort of at risk in the in the showdown. Brooks not there. Brooks is currently uh, just slipped. behind. So right. the people that are fighting for that last place, there's Lee Jackson, yeah. Bradley Ray, and Brooksy, yeah. and one of them three is going to pretty much end up in the showdown. It is mathematically possible for like say Skinner and Vickers. Is Vickers still yeah, in, yeah. in no, contention? Yeah, yeah. yeah, so technically they would all have to. Have a bit of a stinger tomorrow. Yeah, they? to be fair, we we would need to win both races. Um, it's possible, yeah. you know, it's possible. Um, and after seventeen, you know, don't ever say it's not going to happen. <laughs> no, exactly. So, uh, I was just about to say, of those three, because um, in today's race, Lee Jackson had had a mechanical DNF, yeah. which is terribly unfortunate because he, not for you, but for him, uh, he got t- taken out in the other crash at Snetterden. Yeah. So he would have been a safe, I yeah. think he would have actually been ahead of Glenn in the championship yeah, yeah. or yeah. Buchan or whoever's ahead of him. Uh, but yeah, so Jackson's uh, been a bit unlucky there. But also with Taron and Jason O'Halloran going out, it meant that to make it worse for Lee, both Brooksy and Scored Bradley more. Ray finished fourth and fifth. Yeah, yeah. So and right, right now it's between it's mainly between them three. But like you said, it, yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And I and I suppose obviously like you know first ever time in the showdown for us, it was it was just um, unreal. It was it was it was massive. You know, it was just like wow, we've we've made that. You know from what we had we've made that and you know the end of 17 there was big promise um and like i say by this point frankie's sort of like helping jake a bit you know he's he's involved by this point um and you know we i wanted to keep him i wanted to keep him because looking around there weren't and it might sound wrong to say there weren't a lot else there's always something else you know what i mean but of what I wanted, you know, I wanted someone raw, I wanted somebody who was going to, you know, deliver, put the heart on the sleeve and and when it come to it, really scrap it out, you know, and really get there. And it's one of them things, if you want to win a championship, you know, 
it, it's all right scoring points and it's all right saying, you know, you need to be in the top eight, you need to be in the top six as it was. No, you don't. You need to be on the podium. You've got to be on the podium because if not, when you get the showdown, you're just left behind, you know. So, you know, said to said to Frankie, like, you know, we was talking about, about Jake and I put an offer on the table. I put two offers on the table. I put an offer on the table of a salary, which I knew I could afford, but with a big bonus structure. Um, and looking back now, I should imagine he's probably like, fuck it, why did I not take that bonus structure? Because he would have earned a lot more than he did. Um, and it surprised me in a way, because he weren't, he weren't shy of confidence, do you know what I mean? But I think, you know, they wanted to go to Moto2, needed a bit of money behind them. You know, I knew that was going to be a stretch. I knew it was going to be a stretch, depending on how the year went X, Y, Z. It was achievable at round, you know, round one pre-season, but depending on how it went. So, you know, but straight from the get-go, the first couple of rounds struggled a bit, did struggle a bit. You know, I think Donington, we qualified 14th, but we had a mare, you know, it was wet all through first three practice, one and two. The first ever lap we had on dry tyres was FP3. I think he made it as far as one lap, Starkey's Bridge, Rider 27 down. And I remember thinking, fuck. And that was the that was the year that they brought the first race forward. We had a 10-minute window between qualifying and uh, and race one. So that 40 minutes of Cadwell seemed like three days to us. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and still to this day, it's a, it's a story you want to hear off Bucking because Bucking said to me, he was like, mate, he was fucking around. He's like, he's trying to get his elbow down on the first ever lap. Just joking, you know what I mean? And it revs Dixie off the clock. It's hilarious because he'll just be like, fucking, fucking, no, I won't, no, I won't. Still speak about it now. It's funny. Um, anyway, it took us time to get the bike back together. You know, he came back and he was like, I think she's all right. He said, it didn't flip or anything. Jesus, when we rolled out of the van, it was, it was fucked, you know. And we had to do a quick job to get it repaired. And we got out, I think we got out for like four laps of qualifying. And he qualified 14th. So Donington, like, first round weren't great. Um, when did we go round two? Brands, would it have been, I think? Yeah, it would have been. Brands, again, not brilliant. Then we went to Alton Park. And, you know, by this point, I've missed, missed a bit in the story, you know, in, in 17. That's that's why 17 turned round. Sorry, there's a bit I missed there. Sarah, now Jake's wife, lovely, lovely woman, you know. And... Speaking to Sarah, you know, she was like, well, you know, there's Glenn Richards, you know, he's he's floating around, he's not doing anything. What about, why don't you speak to Glenn? And I remember thinking, fucking, I've watched that bloke, you know, he's mega. And I'm thinking, he going to want to come and work for me. You know, why is he wanting to do that? And anyway, I rang him and I spoke to him and he was like, yeah, I'm up for it, mate. I'll come and, you know, we'll come and do the Alton Park test. I'll come and help you out and we'll, we'll see. And he rocked up at the Alton Park test, cool as cucumber, typical Aussie, you know, in a in a monster jacket which he's had for like 14 years i think and he's he's rocked up and you know glenn the thing with glenn he just he wasn't he was a bit of an enigma really he wasn't like blowing his own trumpet he rocked up and he went right we need to start somewhere and he literally just measured up the super stock bike put them into the super bike and first ever time dixie rode it he came back and he went mate that is night and day better he said it is unreal and that was the ground we started at. You know, we've been, like, just pissing around before, and that was where we started at. And he, he transformed a lot of things in 17. You know, he pulled Jake together. He got his confidence back, started delivering with the bike. The bike was working well. You know, we had we had a great time, like, the end of that 17. And that's why in 18, I said to Glenn, like, I need you on board. Um, so we'd done the deal with Glenn to, to have him crew chief. Tim Seed was the electronics guy. Um, and we had a strong team. And that's one thing that, soon becomes apparent you need them sort of people in a team you know you can have the best rider in the world but if you ain't got a team and if you haven't got the right team you'll struggle and that was the thing in 18 you know we we knew that we were gonna we were gonna have a proper go um and we delivered you know and from Alton Park that round three I was saying about you know bang straight on the podium and he wasn't off the podium from round three all the way through to, I think it was round 11, I think mm -hmm. it was. And, you know, that day at Alton Park when we went back there um, and obviously it was just unreal. I think he topped every session, broke the lap record, and it just won both races, you know, pole position in both races. And to have have a team, 
I think there was probably everyone in the team got a watch that year. He won that many watches. He was like the lucky, lucky man, you know, on holiday. He literally, <laughs> everyone got a watch. It was unreal. And that was that was just nice. Do you know what I mean? He knew, he knew deep down, he was like, these boys work hard for me. And he knew what had happened in 17, you know, and he don't, we laugh about it now. He, you know, he's ridden that GP bike round here the other weekend and we still talk like we're mates and we still have fun and, you know, we still reminisce on those days that were dark, you know, and they were dark days. They were hard days. They're days when you go, fucking, what am I doing this for? I ain't making no money at the job. What am I doing it? And anyway, so 18 was just a mega year, you know, just unreal. Just, it f- just flew by in a way. And the results for a, a small independent privateer team from Norfolk, um, very backward down that way we are, but uh, <laughs> just like, it was just unreal, you know, to take it to the like the factory Kawasaki team and Leon Haslam, you know, someone who I'd watched growing up, you know, on that Airways bike and, you know, riding what he's ridden, you know, the experience. And there's us, you know, beating them and and beating them convincingly at times. And then you got the whole Cadwell Park fiasco with the leg dangle, you know. Oh, that's how it's it is brilliant. You know, it's brilliant. It was it was great. And that's what that's what BSB needs, isn't it? You know, it's just it's a show at the end of the day. So days like that, you know, just they don't come around very often. Um, and for what will you get from it at the end of it? You know, you, you get a trophy and but it's just it's just to see the satisfaction in everyone's faces. Um, and yeah, we've been up against it at times. You know, some of the times it's been hard, but to win the team championship in 18, you know, I didn't even know that existed. I didn't realize there was a team championship. And we won that, you know, we, we, we beat the Bournemouth team to it, you know, factory team, you know, we haven't even mentioned the likes of Bacams and PBM, you know, big money teams compared to us. You know, you look at what we have in a, in a year as, as sponsorship and commitment and input compared to those sort of teams to do what we did was just, it's just unreal. And that's not me blowing my own trumpet. That's me thanking the people that are involved and the people that have believed in me, the people that have put money in, products in, and time that's the big thing that people don't get back and people don't appreciate that enough Aye. other people's time you know it was just unreal mm. so you know and i knew i knew he was going you know we 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 talked about it i knew he was moving on he wanted to go to moto too and in a way i was proud of that because what i didn't want him to do i didn't want him to go to another team and not sound that's not sounding horrible but i didn't want him to go to another team and then go and win a championship when we potentially could have had him for another year, you know. Doing what you did with Jake, did with him being like a young, uh, with lots of potential and the experience of taking him into his first year in Superbikes and sort of seeing that um, that your potential to sort of grow into race winning and challenging yeah. for the championship, did that inspire your decision to sign Ryan from yeah. Stock 600? Yes. Um, yes, because it's the enjoyment of... At the end of the day, it's not just about riding. It's about it's about the person. It's about everything. You know, I like to think that we can work on a package. You know, when you make that step, naturally the media involved in it, the publicity involved in it, the connectivity, the people suddenly think, you know, a bit like yourself, you can win races. You're at the front of races. And then straight away people think, I can know he's going to win the BSB race, you know, first time out. It'd be lovely if you could. And some people will. But, it's not to say that you're any worse or any better than the person if they've done it and you haven't. And it's very hard. And that was the thing that was the thing with, you know, with, with Jake. It was an emotional roller coaster. When he was high, he was high. When he was down, he was literally down. So you had to learn how to 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 work with that, how to work with him. And that's, you know, one of the things that's helped me. And like you said there with with signing Ryan. And how that sort of come about for how that sort of come about for me is 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 Ryan's local to me as well. Um, he's only literally twenty minutes from 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 the from the workshop, and I suppose how I first sort of noticed it was we've got a local paper, a Norwich paper called the Eastern Daily Press, and we're getting results. You know, we're we're, we're fucking smashing it. You know, we've just broke the lap record at Old Park, won everything. I open the Eastern Daily Press and there's this fucking, this little blonde-haired whippersnapper who's took centre page and we've got like a small little bit in the corner without even a picture. And I'm like, the fuck is this all about? Ryan Vickers? Ryan Vickers who? You know what I mean? What is this? And then next week, Ryan Vickers again. And I'm like, fucking hell. And that's how it sort of came out, you know, through seeing it. So I thought, 
I need to pay a bit of attention to this kid, you know. So I started watching him a bit, started seeing what he was doing, started going out on the track, you know, going out on the scooter, just watching bits and pieces. And, you know, f- f- for me, he had a nice style. I liked his style. I liked the way he rode. Um, and like I say, I wasn't scared about taking the risk on because we'd done it before. And I kind of felt that we was, the t- or I probably was the right person to do that. You know, not to expect too much, to give the person time to develop and to progress, not be a big team who have probably got a lot bigger commitments, a lot bigger sponsors who want to see a result straight away. You know, we didn't have that with the REF, you know, it was very different. So we was in a position to sort of nurture and that's that's it's rare. What, sorry. It's rare it's that's yeah. a rare option really. Yeah, it is. But it's something that I enjoy doing. Yeah. And I probably oh, won't, it's a good thing. Definitely won't go thing. away from that. You know, yeah. I want to keep doing that going forward. Definitely. Mm. Definitely. And what, one thing uh, over the... Th- drink. Yeah, yeah, sure. Just grab one. Um, one thing over the last few years with Ryan and sort of taking him from a stock 600 sort of riding style and sort of yeah. t- teaching him how to ride a super bike. As part of that, a lot of... Um, there's a lot of crashing involved, isn't there? And it's it's <laughs> it's very difficult. It's unbelievable, um, unbelievably eggs and omelets and something like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is very much Big like that. <laughs> what omelet? <laughs> and as part of that, um, it takes a, a special sort of team to stick by yeah. a rider for. Is it this will be your third, third year, year together? Third, yeah, third year. Jesus. And there's been times where you know, like there's been great potential shown very early on yeah. first year and then there has been times where I, I almost feel like where next and like yeah, yeah. one <clears throat> one thing springs to mind at Brands Hatch I think it was the end of maybe the first first season and um, this the end of the season it finished with like I think you maybe crashed like three or four times in a weekend and yeah. was like right at the back and I think nearly everyone in the paddock would look at that and think well they've given it a good go for a season yeah, yeah. but you know, with a, an established team like that, who with spon- the sponsorship and you know expecting results, they'll probably be trying somebody else next year. Yeah, it takes a very special type of team to um, to have the faith in the in the rider yeah. to keep giving them opportunities like that. And I guess that's a credit to credit to you and the the team for, for doing that. Yeah, no, it, it's very easy to sort of like turn your back on it, you know. But like I said there before people had quitted on me and I knew what it felt like, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm not, I'm not one of them people that would do that. You know, it's, I'd invested a lot. <clears throat> I'd invested a lot. You know, we, we had a lot of crashing, but in a way, you know, I think probably the biggest thing, you know, Ryan jumped on the bike and it was fast straight away, you know, very fast. That's a big step from stock 600 big, straight up into big. a super bike. That's, that's I, huge. You know, we, we went away to, we went away to Cartagena end of 18 just to give him a run out on the bike and you know we're on we're flying over and you know i was nervous i was thinking fuck me what's gonna happen you know please you know there's some parts of Cartagena that are fast and there's not a lot of runoff and i remember thinking you know you're sending him out on you know potentially a missile you know it's it's you know there's not really you can help him as much as you think but at the end of the day it's how hard he wants to twist the throttle um and he rode really well, rode really well. Um, he did have an off um, into the first corner right at the end of the day. Um, and to be fair, it weren't really his fault. You know, he had a bit of engine, bit of push um, and went down. Not really, it wasn't really a big crash. It was just that it looked worse because the gravel, like I say, at Cartagena is just horrendous. Um, but we came away from there. I was happy. You know, I remember thinking, fuck. He's going to high side himself to the moon like first couple of laps, but he didn't. You know, he he just chipped in and just just worked at it. Um, but like I say, he was fast. But I don't know. You know, the I think expectation was high. You know, expectation and probably a bit of pressure from somewhere. You know, was just like was just high. Um, and in a way, I think probably that's what the where the crashing came. You know, because of the expectation. Um, I think if it had just sort of stepped back a bit and just, you know, I don't need to run at this, let's just walk and let, you know, and I think probably in a way it could have gone smoother at the start because 
Yeah, I remember that day. We went through three frames at uh, at Brands Hatch. Um, it was a big day, and probably a lot of teams would have probably been like, "You've had enough now, sunshine." A, g- a good example would be uh, when Alex Laws was stepped up to super bikes and he was riding yeah. for Nick Morgan, and he was fast, but yeah. he had a few crashes. And it, it, the way it, you know, it's no uh, secret to anyone. Motorbikes are extremely expensive bits of kit, yeah, and. Even if you're winning, if you're throwing it up yeah. the road, things it's and it's a very fickle business. Yeah. Um. But yeah, like uh, times like say Cadwell Park when you when you did posted the fastest yeah. lap and uh, you, little moments like that, you must um you must feel very proud to like to sh- have shown that faith and then to have been repaid yeah, like that. You've, you've got to you've got to show that faith. You've got to believe in someone. If you if you don't believe in them, then it's it's pointless, pointless doing it. Yeah. yeah, because you're not doing it for the right reasons. Um. And the other thing is as well, you know, you're invested in it. At the end of the day, um, year one, I think we had like 86 grams worth of crash damage. But what you've also got to look at that is I could have quite easily turned around and gone, right, okay, yeah, we're not doing anything next year. Um, So why invest all that money in a project that you're not going to see through? You know, and I wouldn't have signed him and I wouldn't have took him from stock six if I didn't think he was capable, you know, and he's... And it's now, it's like, you know, I fucking stood there on pit wall, just like, I, there's no one want that podium more than I do. Not for me, for him, mm-hmm. you know, because it's like, I don't know, I just, I feel for him because he's just got so much talent. Mm-hmm. And there's, and in a way, the first year he rode the bike, he rode it very similar to, to Jake. Um, but I suppose in a way, Jake had had a lot more experience on tarmac, you know, you forget that Ryan's really in his like his fifth year on tarmac. You know he's moved progressed very quickly, very quickly. He was motocross background before, um, and you know, like I say, I've got a lot of belief in him. A lot of belief. Um, he's shown amazing talent. Um, a few small errors, yeah, I get that. But again, when you're at that pace, you're gonna you're gonna show that. And I think because probably he hasn't had that podium. All eyes are always on him. Do you know what I mean? It's, until he until he breaks it. Yeah, Aye, yeah, that's it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And but why? You know, why does that need to? Why do people need to put that pressure on young riders? You know, I said to I think it was Larry Carter said to me uh, maybe Snetterton or Cadwell. You know, the podiums come in. I said, mate, I don't care if we win the championship and we ain't got a podium. I said, you know, who needs a podium? Oh yeah, but it's coming, it's coming, isn't it? And I was like, what does it matter if it don't come? You know, it doesn't. You know. And you go back to like Muir and and his run in the MotoGP, and I don't think he won a race all that year, did he? And then won one one, one race, yeah, won one race, and won a championship. Same as when Nicky Hayden won the championship, yeah. in two, it was the two thousand and six. Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, well, so it was him and Rossi, yeah, yeah. and he crashed. I don't, yeah, yeah. I, I think he the he. I don't think he won a race that year. I don't think he did. No, no. Yeah, I mean, dead consistent. And like, yeah, and that's like you know that's like and he was you know. world champ. Yeah, they are, and every and everyone's like, oh, he needs that podium. Yeah, he needs it for himself. You know, but the monkey off the back is what he needs. Um, and it's like you say, you know, the second year, he was just unlucky. You know, a couple of crashes he had. He had a crash at uh, Donington, smashed his collarbone. Had a big crash at um, at Brands. Well, I say a big crash. He crashed at Brands. It was a fast crash. It was in the clear ways. Smacked himself about, you know. He ended up. He had concussion, big concussion. He didn't know where he was. You know, he was. He had. A, he had a big. Excuse me, a big head injury from I that. I don't think people know how serious that, that was. was bad. No, it was, quite, it was bad. It was kept quite quiet. Wasn't yeah, yeah, it? yeah. It was. Yeah. Um, but the thing being as well, you know, you look at it and you th- and some people are like, oh yeah, you know, he's crashed there, and but not being funny, Dixie crashed there. Did exactly the same over the bump into clearways. Taz did exactly the same. Yeah, same weekend. Ryan crashed there. Exactly the same. And it's just... <laughs> Motorcycle racing. It's a bit like swimming. You're going to get wet. <laughs> yeah. you? you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, and, and nine times out of ten, you can look at places and you know people are going to crash there. And people have crashed there. And yeah. it, it's always going to catch people out. You know, there's certain areas of tracks that are always going to catch people out. And like I say, it's the, t- the talent's there. You know, I, I believe in him a lot. And... It will come. I believe before the end of the year, he will get a podium. Um, and like you say, uh, the, we're together now the third year. We've made some changes this year to to the bike, different to where we've been before. You know, our swinging arms are very, I wouldn't say very different, slightly different. 
um, in terms of like the pickup linkage point and the the crew chief that we had this year you know and with with ryan they wanted to basically run a, a higher ride height in the rear of the bike but because of where the pickup was on the on the swinging arm you struggled to run a higher ride height when you run a ri- higher ride height basically the the shock was fouling on the on the dog bone which wouldn't allow you to run that 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 length so um we spoke about it and this was after it was before thruxton so after brands turnaround of you know like three days we leave on a wednesday and it was a back-to-back we go into the workshop monday morning i've booked the week off you know need to be in the workshop prepping the bike so i go into the workshop uh monday morning and stewie's like yeah i've been talking with ryan we need to look at, at changing the uh the pivot you know the, the pickup we want to we want to go higher on the ride height we want more on the front end of the bike so you know i, I sort of said to him Probably my first reaction was, but why is the bike turned shit overnight? You know, it smashed the lap record at Assen. You know, it's the fastest of a BSB bike round round Assen. You know, Alton Park. But you know, Stewie said to me, you know, it's, it's preference of rider. It's different, and a lot of teams, I think, in a way, would probably be a bit like, well, yeah, but you, you know, he's got to learn to ride it. And you know, maybe that was my first impression. But then when me and Stewie spoke and we talked about it and we discussed it, and I went. Right, okay, we need to get it done. And Ryan, before he before he finished his his sort of full time job to take this up as a career, he worked at a company called Multimatic in in Thetford, his hometown. Again, not far from us. Massive concern. Do a lot of stuff with suspension in F one and Red Bull and all sorts. And and Ryan was a machinist when you know working there, so he understands all of this side of it. You know, he's great as a as an engineer. So. He rocks up at the workshop for his debrief and I just literally just arrived with two swinging arms and I went, mate, if you want them changing, you need to get to Multimatic and beg, steal and borrow and try and get them to do that. I said, I've rung around my contacts, can't get it done in the time we want it doing, basically today and tomorrow. So he called in a favour at Multimatic. He rocked up with two swinging arms. Him and Stewie went there, explains what we needed. They cut it off. There was a lot of work involved. It weren't just cut it off and re-weld it. You know, there was a lot of work. It had to all be measured. It had to be precise. You know, we're, we're talking within like, you know, point point one, point two of a mil. Um, and they got the job done. We had two swinging arms from Thruxton and night and day. You know, it transformed. You can see the bike. that, yeah, from Donington. I know, yeah. really, un- <clears throat> really unlucky, but pace yeah, yeah. wise, as fast as it, like anybody, Thruxton, you know, other than that really small crash, it, would, it was a podium in the bag. Yeah. Uh, Cadwell, the pace, uh, pace yeah. of the, yeah, running into Snetterd and the pace of the f- uh, previous few weekends was, um, yeah, yeah, very impressive. It's, it's took a massive step. And, you know, in a way, it's probably took, if you asked him, he'd probably say, yeah, I wanted that, you know. You know, year one, I wanted that. He knows now that's what he wanted, but probably at the time, probably didn't quite know what he wanted to to deliver that, you know. Um, And working with Stuart, you know, he's probably found that. They've understood it between them, and they're like, right, this is what we need. And one of the things that a lot of people have sort of said to me is, you know, he, he looks a bit desperate, you know, he looks desperate, but he's not desperate. Basically, what how I sort of like look at it is you look at top rack in world superbike compared to Johnny Ray top rack looks loose. He looks out of control at times. He's not, he's just a different riding style. And Ryan in a way is very similar to, to, to that in BSB. A lot of BSB are like, you know, when you come in as a superbike, oh, you got to stop it. You got to turn it, you got to fire it. Why have you, you know, if you can carry corner speed and you can run corner speed, and you can get a tire to light to last why not do that you know and in a way you look at like how he rode thruxton was very different to how a lot of other people rode it he has a lot of lean angle you know he hangs off the bike a lot he's very gp very modern style um but it looks different because there's a lot of other riders in bsb that aren't like that you know Mm. and he does stand out so because he stands out people then think that he's he's riding a bit desperate but he's not he's just got a different style and like donington you know he said to me he was like i just cannot believe like how slow some people are through the corners he was like there's just no corner speed it's like in turn go but he said they don't really gain anything over a race you know there's no difference so i don't get why they can't run the corner speed 
Um, so yes, his style's very different to a lot of other people. So he stands out to the to the public, and stands out to people in the paddock. And what you have got to look at is when you are when you're developing young talent, you can't crush it. You know, these are young kids who are grown up watching Marquez. You know, there's some people that don't even know who Rossi is, you know, who's this old boy at the back, the old flogger, you know, just riding round. They haven't got a clue, you know, because they've come into it when it's like the young guns, the people that are there now, the young kids that are delivering. And they watch that and they tend to like follow that trend. You know, you think back to years ago when no one ever had the knee down, someone put the knee down. Now, you know, you would never ride a bike without putting your knee down now. You know what I mean? And then the elbow goes down. And it's, oh, fucking hell, he's got his elbow down. Then the leg comes out. Oh, the leg's out, you know. And it's just like that with, with Ryan. He just rides very European in a way. You know, it's just different to what BSB's got. And it's so easy to go, ah, oh, mate, you know, you shouldn't be riding like that. You know, you should be riding like the 40-year-old over there who's like in, stop, turn, go. You know, that's how BSB's about. Yeah, why should you? I, I was just listening to a podcast on the way down here, and, and uh, it was no Sir James Dyson. Oh yeah, the, the, the Hoover the, dude. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. Hoover dude. And uh, when he first had his uh, idea, and he made, <laughs> and he went to uh, some investors, yeah. every single one of them said to him, um, "If if if there was a better way of doing it, uh, all the top manufacturers would have already <coughs> done it and pied him off and pied him off and pied him off." Yeah, and ended up he's the biggest. He's the um, largest landowner in the UK and went on, I think he's got 6,000 engineers working for him right now and none of them would have invested in him because they all said like, if there was a better way then. So, you yeah. know, sometimes you, you have got, and from doing this- You've just got to suck it up. <laughs> well, no, if, if, you, if you believe in something and you, you know, it's it, there is, there's more than one way yeah. to skin a cat, isn't it? Of course there, there is, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and not everything can be the same. Someone's got to do something different if not everyone's going to do the same thing in life. And no one will progress. Can I just say, from doing this podcast, obviously we spoke to quite a lot of team managers and writers about team managers and stuff. Mm. I've, and this is a huge compliment to you. I've never heard a team manager speak about so every single uh, crash that you've spoke about. You've all, you've always defended the rider. And you, you've never once like so everything you've talked about, you've said something, and then I'm you've said, but, but you know, but to, be, <laughs> but to be fair, like it was sort of the engine braking's fault. It was sort of you sound like a, do you know when you hear riders talking about crashes, and then you hear team owners talking about crashes, and it's like yeah. complete. It's usually a completely different side of Poor the coin. But you, you sound like you're on the side of the rider, and like proper it, the the support from the team is like very obvious from what you're saying, basically. Yeah, you have to. You have it, to. It keeps the neck brace from Hickman. You know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> just scans, sorry. Just, uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's just very obvious listening to you, like how uh, yeah. how supportive you are, and every you have to every be. time you've mentioned a crash, you've always followed up with. But when you push into the limits, so this this has happened, and yeah. things you're like sort of defending the riders all the time. And I, I've got to say, I think that's um, that that is obvious to see in like the, yeah. how the teams ran. It's good the, to see. Like, that's like with you know we've taken we're taking young Rolo on this year um with with stock thousand and it was like it was like lewis said to me you know he was he'd come into the team you know respect the team and it he was like the bike was pristine and i think in a way he was a bit when he came in he was a bit worried he was thinking Fuck me, you know i don't want to crash this thing you know and he, he's been riding really well and i can't remember what test we was at we was at a test and ryan went down somewhere and I want to say, was it on par? I can't remember. And he was just sat there with this big grin on his face, just like almost a bit scared, like, fuck, how's he going to react to this? And I didn't really react to it. And afterwards, Rolo was just like, mate, I've never been in a garage when someone has just crashed. Really, probably for a little bit of their own fault, he went, and the, like, the team owner or the manager has not revved out. He went, I can't believe how you reacted. And I went, yeah, but it's happened, hasn't it? What is the point? You know, it's it's done, it's dusted, it's happened. You cannot you cannot go back and change things. You're not going to change anything apart from make that person feel even more shitter than he already is. And it, and in a way, if they apologise for it and it's sincere, then it's respected. If it's just like you know treated in a different way, then yes, there's a point when you have to rein it in and you have to speak about it. But at the end of the day, people are learning. You know, people are developing. 
I, it's it's no different with anything in life. You're not going to just you're not just going to go into something and be amazing at it and never make a mistake. There's always going to be a wrong door that you're going to go through. Um, and just sort of touching a bit on there, Lewis. You know, we we spoke a lot about me, a lot about the superbike side and everything else. And like you know, Lewis is a competitor of yours, racing his stock thousand. And really, this year, you know, he's. It, He's done well because we've had a lot of issues with the new bike. Um, we've struggled a lot with um, with a chatter issue, but he's been professional about it. You know, he's kept his head up. He's he's tried, and he's been there. And you know, he's always a strong starter. Like the first lap, we have this little thing in the garage. It's quite funny, really. He's got a good sense of humour as well. Where you know, I think it was Cadwell was twenty second on the grid. And a few little spattering bits of rain and, you know, he's getting all giddy because it's getting wet because he doesn't get so much chatter in the wet. So he's a bit more happier. So, um, you know, we always have this thing before the race. We're like, right, where are you going to be on lap one? Ah, I'll be in the top 10, Lee. And I'm like, fucking, he ain't going to be in the top 10. I think it was Donington, actually. Comes round eighth. And we're like, fucking, hell, how's he eighth? So we've got this little jokey thing now. We'll always say to him, right, where are you going to be on lap one? Uh, probably P9. And I'm like, right, I'm putting P9 on the board. I don't care if you're 18th, I'm putting P9 on the board. And it's just like little things like that. And he's done a great job this year. You know, he's he's only been off the thing once in the, in the whole time he's ridden it. Um, and he's not been right. You know, he shouldn't be qualifying 22nd on a stock grid. That's not taking anything away from that class. It's a fierce class. It's close, you know, but he should be at the front. He should be there week in, week out, you know, battling for for race wins and we haven't we haven't got the bike we haven't got the bike right for him it's been in a window where he can operate with it but it's not in a window where he can race with it do you know what i mean it's he's literally hanging on to the thing for for the results that he's getting and you know that that podium he had at, at donnington fucking i don't know where that came from you know he just he just rode the wheels off it and you know it was wet it was iffy conditions and he's good in them conditions, but knowing that the bike that he had underneath him, it weren't the best on, on that grid. Mm -hmm. And he's done a great job. And and he is doing a very good job, you know. And I've got a lot of time for him. I think he will be, I think potentially going forward, he will be a good rider, you know. As in, that sounds really wrong, doesn't he? He is a good rider now, but I think he's got potential, you know, to step up. I really do. I think he could go to, to Superbike. I think he could deliver. I like his attitude. I like the way he goes about things. Um, and I think he has got he's got something there. There's just something a bit raw about him. Do you know what I mean? Not not raw as in just like uncontrollably fast, but he's very he's mechanically minded in a way as well. You know, he rocked up on the grid at, at, at Cadwell and the clutch was slipping a bit. You know, most riders would have it fried their heads a little bit. He's in there adjusting the clutch and like, yeah, I've got this. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And when Vickers had the crash in qualifying. He's there on the spanners, literally just like into it. And he needed it really because it was straight after his qualifying. It had a horrendous qualifying in terms of position. His head was down, you know, he was like, I thought, fucking hell, I need to put an arm around him here, you know, because I thought he's going to go back to the camp or he'll come back and like the world's ended, you know, no one wants to be that place on the grid. And like I say, he knows that he's better. I know that he's better. Um, put my arm around him and just said that, you know, just... Don't worry about it, you know. Race day is a different day. We'll work hard, and we have worked hard. I've got to thank the team as well, because the team on that side of the garage have done everything. Mm -hmm. No one's lost faith, you know. No one's given up on the bike. No one's given up on him. It'd be very easy just to go, you know what, that ain't going to happen. Let's go to a different manufacturer, or let's do this, let's do that. I could have built him a super bike for here, you know, and the the problems would have gone gone away. But the great thing was, he rang me after Snetterton, and he was like, Lee, I don't want to do that. And I was like, I don't want to do it either. I said, because at the end of the day, we're giving in. And I don't want to give in because if I give in, then you're going to give in. And I said, I don't want to give in. And he was like, no, and I don't want to ride a superbike till we sort that fucking thing out and it don't chatter and I can win on it. He's like, when we do that, then we can look at moving forward. And I just thought, what a great attitude because so many people would have gone, yeah, build me a superbike because everyone aspires to be on that grid. And it would have been just like, bang, I've got it. I've done it. I haven't really had to work for it and I've got the opportunity. So it was incredible that he just went, no. And I thought I respected him more for that in a way because he went, no. And yeah. I was just like, Stonewall as well, like hard face, 
proper Scottish. No. I'm like, <laughs> all right, okay, snow. No, Don't no. hurt me. <laughs> no, he's, yeah, he's Put a, the iron brew down. <laughs> he's, uh, he's a great lad and a uh, nice family and everything as yeah, well. Yeah. Um, for next year, have you got are you got your plan sorted in terms of what championships you're doing and for the short circuits and the roads? Um, not really, no. Um, we are, for next year, we've lost the, I wouldn't say lost, the Royal Air Force are pulling out its title sponsor. Um, so basically that's something that's been discussed and it's sort of come from results, publicity you know from terms of the results haven't quite been there from where we've been before you know delivering that so it, it, it's sort of like been coming a little bit i knew that it was it was happening um and like i say that's that's them i suppose withdrawing is is the right word to use um and you know we've been together nine years we've had a good run of it we've had a we've had a great sponsorship but the good thing is it opens the door to other people um, we've done some stuff with a company called MKM Building Supplies at Sneston. They're already a sponsor for this year, and we're looking at potentially sort of moving them up to, to a title sponsor. Um, at the moment, we're working with a guy called Gavin, who's the director of the branch in Norwich, which is local to us. Um, and they came to Snet and they had 100 VIPs. They had, a, they had a great day out. You know, we've done a special livery there for them with their corporate colors. Um, and you know, the, the good thing is it's a brand that everyone, everyone has access for, you know, they're not just trade, it's trade and, you know, public people can go in there, do modifications, garden, bathrooms, whatever, you know, it's, it's everything. So, you know, from that side for the, for this sort of sponsorship would be really good for them. You know, anyone can have access to them and it's something that everyone will use at some point. So um, yeah, we're talking with them, and we've got another another sponsor that's come on board this year. Um, they're a company at the moment. They're involved with a team in the Premier League. Um, they've got a big sponsorship going on there, um, and they're in a position of looking at different things. So we've got a couple of meetings with them planned coming up um, in the next sort of coming weeks, and it's really just dependent on where we go and at what level people come in at um which is why i haven't made too many decisions yet and i'm not really rushing into making too many decisions a lot of people have been speaking to me um but i've just been up front you know and just sort of said look we're in a position where <clears throat> we want to know where we're going as a team and at what level before i sort of jump in and commit to something and also in a way as well i'm not one of them right not one of those um sort of team owners and managers who would jump in and commit to a rider not knowing that a hundred percent everything's in place either because you're playing with someone's future someone's career someone's progression you know it's got to be right and everything in place to to do so but ultimately i'd like to go back to running the two super bikes like we have done before you know it's something we played at last year when kennedy came in and done the three rounds with us done an amazing job um really nice guy to work with so i want to go back to that route you know stocks proved hard this year very hard um i want to stay with the kawasaki brand you know we're, we're really happy with that the super bike's amazing you know the bike's working well so i'm in a position where i'm sort of talking to people i've got a few ideas what i want to do um but always open you know to to discussion you know it's something you never really know who's interested until you get to that point and then suddenly you think i didn't even speak to them i didn't even consider that you know and sometimes you, you do miss opportunities so you know there's loads of people as well that, that potentially are going to be looking for rides you know there's all the paddock rumor on at the moment that sykes is coming back and potentially davis or is he going to honda you know what's he doing potential of, of other riders move into world championship which opened doors for other people to move so there's so much going on i think this year potentially i think you'll see i do think you'll see a bit of a shake-up i really do mm -hmm. and i think it needs it as well you know there's a lot of riders that that tend to sort of move from one team to another <clears throat> they turn the the kawasaki into a yamaha or into a ducati and that's what i had when i was there yeah but is that really what you need you know what i mean you want you want fresh talent you know we need we need to spice it up a bit and i think you know vickers has proved that this year you know ian ian afraid of getting in amongst it which you know andrew Irwin is is the same and yeah sometimes it can be a little bit you know a bit frisky and you're like whoa hang on a minute 
But at the end of the day, it's racing, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And that's what that's what people pay to come through the gate to see. I'm not saying they come to see other riders taking other riders out, but they come to see hard. Don't want to see a procession. Fast. Yeah, mm-hmm. of course you don't. You want to see hard, fast racing, close racing. You know, and that's that's what we all love. Mm-hmm. And uh, in terms, obviously, I know you said you're not. Um committing to anything just yet and like sort of waiting for the sponsorship but is the idea to look at the roads as well yeah definitely i want to go i want to go back to doing the roads um i've missed doing the northwest and missed doing the tt it's a it's a big part really that that i enjoy doing as a as a team owner um like i touched on before you know the the involvement you know building a bike that's going to go and do the isle of man you know and go around and do 37 miles and be absolutely flogged to death you know you've got to you've got to be on point with it you know you've got to be able to deliver something that you know is going to be right and it's almost you know it's a bit of a it's a bit of a turn on really in a way to do that you know it's my bread and butter you know being a being a mechanic technician by trade it's <clears throat> it's something that you want to you want to do and you want to be involved in you know and sometimes as well having the input and just looking at things you know been around the roads as a team a lot we've had a lot of success you know and you always see you always see the road riders again they're very i don't know a bit fickle in a way you know super bike class you know it's a senior i need to have a super bike and you know they're doing 100 135 mile an hour on a stocker you know why do you need a super bike all this is going to do is make the 135 mile up an hour harder you know you might get there a little bit quicker and you might stop in some places but it's not to say it's necessarily going to be any easier it's just going to be a difference you know when you are when you're at that point you know we we was going to do something with with paul jordan last year he's moved to press race hasn't he yeah yeah well sort of basically what happened there paul spoke to me and he was like you know we've got a contract in place but he said, you know, I want to be doing more short circuit riding. So he's like, you know, would you be happy to release me from the contract so I can go there and do some short circuit stuff with them? However, that's not really come off. You know, he was looking at doing some super sport this year with them and it's not really sort of come to fruition. You know, it's, uh, I think he's, he's doing something at the moment now, but it's been a long while since we had that conversation to get to where he is. So, but the thing being, you know, they, they weren't silly. They were like, yeah, we'll do some short circuit stuff with you. Yeah, 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 we'll do that. But, you know, you'll have to do the roads for us. And obviously, you know, being a rider, got really giddy and went, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. It might do, you know, a couple of hours in short circuit, but they've got a rose rider, you know, and it's, it, you've just got to look at the bigger picture. And sometimes, you know, no disrespect to you two on that side, you know, I've been a rider, you are riders, but sometimes it's a bit, it's a bit like that. It's now not what it could be you know you've got to look at the bigger picture all the time and and just sort of like probably do things differently to what everyone does you know and when you do that it tends to tends to reward you better and it tends to come back you know in the long run it comes comes back better mm-hmm. uh, just uh we're on a patreon page we've got a few questions on there but i'll just pick the best one which was uh sniff and skid marks asked about uh something about a flowery shirt thing from canterbury are there a team sponsor or something Flourish of I, I, I know who that was. You're that talking. Are you talking about Matt Late with the? Is it a smashy and nicey picture? It's it. It says, <laughs> it says have you ever bought bought a flowery shirt from a gentleman's outfit as in Canterbury? Was impressed they were a team sponsor. No, I don't know what that is. The only one I can is think. In joke. By the way, you, you uh, this podcast isn't actually out yet, but I was listening to the edit on the way down here. We had Matt Late on the podcast the yeah, other day, yeah. and uh, what we, a fella we, he we is. <laughs> What a fella. We got talking about doing the Daytona 200 and he said, get Lee Hardy on the podcast. And he said he'd pay for done. everything. <laughs> There's a deal to be done. Is he doing some uh, work for a trailer for you or something? And yeah, he said, he's... let's let's peer pressure him into getting over to Daytona. <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, I've got a, I've got a second trailer, um, which is, it's in the process of, uh, the roof's been lowered on it. It's got a tail lift on it and I want him to put a load of slide outs on it and different bits and pieces. And, uh, and I bought I bought a six hundred for for the roads which we was building for Paul. We went a bit crazy during lockdown, and uh, and I was like, I want you know, you always have like a rider will come and he's like, yeah, I ride a six hundred for for them, and I do this and I do that, and you know, I wanted to have it all under one roof, one one brand, you know, because the other thing is as well, when you've got other riders going off doing other things, they're over there debriefing, then they're over here debriefing, and you know, it's just a bit disjointed, and. 
and also, Paul, bless him, he said to me, he said, I've, yeah, I've got a 600, yeah, I've got a 600, you know, I, why don't we use that? I said, what is it? It's an R6. I was like, fucking hell, you know, it's a good 600 then. Yeah, yeah, she's mint, she's a minter. Anyway, get some dude in a transit van with, like, more dents and I don't know what, rolls up with this bike. I got a bike for you, mate, and a couple of stands and a spare engine and some wheels. I was like, oh, yeah, brilliant, because I said I'd go over it for him and, you know, prep it up and that. So, anyway... This 600 R6 rolls out, and I'm like looking around it. And Ben Staffley was working for me at the time, you know. We were just looking around it, and we were just like, What the? F-? We, we looked at each other, looked back at the bike, and then looked at each other again and looked back at the bike to say, What has just turned up? And, you know, as you do, whether you ride a mechanic or wherever you are, Joe Public, you twist the throttle, don't you? So I twist the throttle. Bearing in mind, he'd ridden this thing at the TET or the Northwest. I twisted the throttle. And I let go of it, and I watched it like close in slow motion like that, and it just slowly closed. And I sent him a video of it, and I was like, what is that? He went, mate, she's mint at the Northwest. He said, when you're flat out, you can just relax, and it'll just stay there. <laughs> and I was just like, Paul, you are that is mint. absolutely mental. That is mint. And like I say, she was a bit of a dog, a blesser, but he absolutely loved it, and you know, I just said to him, I said, mate, the money I'm going to spend on that to get it ready, I might as well just buy my own. And we did. We bought we bought a ZX6. Um, and like I say, it's in the position of, it's pretty much built, and he's a wiring loom and an engine doing on it, and she's, she's good to go. So, um, yeah, it's it's a bit of a... Potential there, anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. And obviously, Matt's crazy in the life out of me. He's like, mate, we need to take that dude Daytona with it. You know, it'll be mega. And obviously, he's ridden Daytona, like, probably 40 years ago when he was a bit younger. And he's like, I'll ride it, I'll ride it, you know, and I'll, I'll do the lorry for you. And I'm just like, wow. But I, I thought what you was going to say there is this... Um, so this picture that I've got here is literally... That's obviously... <laughs> Alan, <laughs> the breakfast <laughs> show. Alan, Alan Partridge and myself. He as you're he, always on the, uh, yeah, the I, local radio. I do a lot of thing on the uh, on radio. It's Radio Norfolk, so it's like the Norwich local radio. And obviously, everyone's heard of Smashy and Nicey, and he'll listen to it. He goes to work, sits in the van, listens to me rambling rubbish, and then he'll ring me up and he's like, "Ah, oh, yeah, the old Smashy and Nicey breakfast show was good this morning." <laughs> and like you say, he's been ribbing me about it, and he, yeah, he's he's funny. I like Matt. He's got a heart of gold. No, he's, really he's, a good lad. he's a good, good lad. lad. He's a good lad. Is um, anything else to wrap things up, Don? I was about to say, no, cracking interview, and thank you for coming on. I think it's been absolutely mint. Have absolutely you got mint. any uh, so p- plugs? Do you sell any tea merchants? Dice or yeah. uh, sp- uh, the plenty Insta- of donuts in yeah. <laughs> Instagram, um, all, all the t- uh, plugs, yeah. yeah. So, ba- basically, Instagram and Facebook is just Lee Hardy Racing. Um, we obviously do sell merchandise, it's something we started doing at Snesson at the last round, and uh. That's available really just through people sort of messaging on Facebook. We, I need to get out and I need to do a bit of a post on it. I'm going to do a post this weekend. But, uh, yeah, it'll be out there. So it's available. Like uh, We do like a casual range. Um, and we also do like a red, white and blue team range as well. So, yeah, that's going awesome. to be available. Fantastic. So Lee Hardy Racing on Instagram and Facebook. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, merchandise. Will be cool. Have you got a website? No. Okay. Not that professional. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, huge thank you to our sponsors, Colchester Kawasaki, and of course, of our patrons. And uh, yeah, but obviously, it is possible that you might make the showdown tomorrow. So good luck. Good luck, ways, going so and Fingers crossed. Anything can happen. And uh, yeah, um, yeah. thanks very much for your time. Cheers. And, uh, thank good you. luck. Good luck the rest of the season. Thanks. Take care, Lee. See you in a bit. Click, buy, deliver. With remote purchasing from the two time Motorcycle News Dealer of the Year. Colchester Kawasaki. Proud sponsors of Chasing the Racing.